understand the topography kind of out in the we think of as the the deep ocean for a while and so we've been able to build up because we're at shallow depths we've been able to build up a thick carbonate platform there and then we can see some of that um, we'll see some of the channelization that stuff actually eroding now and making its way down into some somewhat deeper basins some are even below um, perhaps below that uh, compensation depth the CCD can also have an important impact on the animals that are living there because there are several of them that will use uh, calcite, calcium carbonate deposits in their skeletons. And so, for example, we've seen many of the bamboo corals and the primnoid corals that have a lot of calcium carbonate deposition, uh, clams, the shell of uh, clams and oysters, for example, and a variety of other um, animals. And so uh, they either have to have mechanisms to uh, basically have a rate of deposition that's faster than the rate of dissolution of that uh, calcite, or else they're not going to be living there. Um, so those may be some other things that uh, we can look for as we're seeing the animals. I think your heart always has to go out to coral. It's trying to build a skeleton in a hostile environment. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Looks like uh, we have acquired bottom here. Uh, we're maybe 40 meters or so off the bottom, so... We're at 4,534 meters, so a little bit deeper even than we were yeah, expecting. Yeah, just, just a little That'll bit. That would be cool. That's all right. Yeah, absolutely. Get our weather report. 1.3 degrees Celsius. 5.3 milligrams per liter of oxygen and a salinity of 34.7 practical salinity units. Oh, all right. Looks like we can get our first view of the bottom here. I think I see rock. That's a good sign. That's a very good sign. And sediment, of course. Yeah, so we're expecting to set down on kind of a, a flat part here before the uh, kind of a steeper slope along this fracture zone. And so we expect it to be more sediment here. And the fact that we looks like we can see some rock is a good sign. And then as we go up that slope, um, our hope is at least that the bottom currents will have, have scouted or sediment. We'll be able to um, see some different animals taking care, taking um, use of some different habitat and potentially have a, a better look at the rocks as we go up this exposure as well. <laughs> Astrid seems just a little less excited about these rocks. Oh, yeah, she likes sediment. Fish <laughs> like sediment. There's lots of sediment. I'm seeing also, I'm sorry if you just said this, uh, Del, but it looks like a lot of uh, patterning on the sediment. Did you just note that? No, I, I have them. This is okay. something we've seen in a few few dives, I guess. Yeah, so I'm interpreting this as a recent deposition of organic material. That is, uh, maybe there was a phytoplankton bloom at the surface, and the stuff that wasn't uh, directly eating, eaten 
has died and has sunk to the surface. Also, um, the stuff that has been eaten and defecated by the various fish and crustaceans up there, there's all still organics in there. As that's sinking through the water column, you saw lots of particulates. We call that marine snow as we're sinking. Uh, bacteria latch onto that. They begin to digest some of the particles, but they themselves are also organic energy. And so all of this is food that uh, settles here in the deep sea. You can imagine that if there are organisms that are feeding on it at every depth level, there's less and less the deeper you go. And that's one of the explanations for why the organisms are fairly small when we get to this depth. There's just not enough food to sustain a larger body size. Yeah, this is something we didn't see in our first few dives when we were further south, but as we came north in the Jarvis, we, we, we've started to notice this material. It gives you a sense it is sort of a regional, maybe a regional bloom or something that yep. um, it has some um, temporal pattern to it. Well, certainly uh, when we're on, the near, on or near the equator, there is a uh, uh, somewhat of an upwelling zone at the equator, and so that should bring some nutrients to the surface where there's abundant sunlight, and you should have some periods of blooms. Astrid's noting that if this is all organic material, where are all the sea cucumbers feeding on it? That's a really good point. Hopefully we will see some. Amanda Netburn is noting that we actually saw more marine snow than you might expect once we got below 2,000 meters. And maybe that's another indication of just how productive the water column is here. So we'll give our, our pilots just a minute here to get saddled, and then we're going to... Yep, T take your time. So Scott, this is um, Chris at UH. And um, in addition to, I think, the, the general sort of detritus you were pointing out there, um, I don't know if you noticed as we were coming down those pockets that may likely be those spherical forams or diatoms. I've forgotten what we decided those were that we saw in the Marianas. Um, I think that's what they were, those uh, pockets of, I call them buckyballs, those uh, weird spherical yeah. structure frameworks of dead large forams, I guess. Yeah, I saw those, Chris. We also just passed over a black coral, which is interesting. And I saw those um, little sphericals uh, sort of being blown over the uh, bottom by the ROV thrust. Uh, but um, from my perspective, this is wonderful. There's a black coral right in front of e us excellent. Uh, yeah, at this uh, first spot that we... <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I believe this is going to be a schizopathies. And this is an interesting... Uh, oh, maybe it's not schizopathies. Maybe that's... Um, uh, help me, Chris. Oh, there's actually two of them. I'm forgetting the name of this particular genus. It has this very distinctive folded over branching. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I was, I'm trying to remember. So Tina was trying to educate me on these things. So there's one of them that has all of the branches facing up and the other one right. that has the branches facing down. Right, exactly. And I think the ones facing down where it was a schizopathies, like you said, uh, and the other one with them up is a bisopathies, but I'm not sure. Well, then I'll go with my first guess of uh, schizopathies. So this is a black coral. This is a member of the um, Nidaria, class Anthozoa, subclass Hexacoralia. Um, black corals are actually more common than a lot of the uh, diverse octocorals that we see in shallower water, all those sea pens are fairly common down here as well. Um, so it's not a surprise to us to find these uh, black corals when we arrive, but uh, great to see two of them immediately. That's right. wonderful. You can go out to the middle of nowhere, drop the ROV down at uh, 4,500 <laughs> meters depth and land on something alive. Exactly. And so that might tell you that they're not <laughs> uncommon. They're maybe a, a relatively abundant. And these are a fairly good size. They're not really tiny. You do see that they are attached to the hard rock. There is a at least one species of schizopathies that has that main stock has a hook that serves as an anchor um, or a root in the sediment. Thank you, pilot. I agree. Bruce Monday has uh, made a note that uh, 
he saw some lines in the sediment, and I did too. There, you can see like there's a furrow. Oh yeah. And that's definitely a feeding trace. So something is moving around the seafloor, feeding, and as it moves, it consumes the sediment ahead of it, and so it leaves this trace, and it's uh. Um, it, it persists for a very long period of time. We note that right here, there's no ripples in the sediment. If there were ripples, it would indicate that the current is moving very quickly. Well, it's not, and so alterations in the sediment persist for a very long period of time. There are, I see these uh, disks. It looks like there's some disks in these feeding traces. I noted three off the screen, but there's one just to the left of the lasers. And I can't, uh, no, to the left. This time, yep, it was a good prediction, because I do do that. <laughs> but now the lasers are just about to touch it. It's a white patch there, right, right there. So I don't know if that's just sediment, but I saw three or four of them. Okay. And I wonder if it's like, it's kind of like an urchin maybe buried or um, something else. I mean, there's definitely something under the sediment there. And here's another one right in the foreground. Oh, I see, right. Yeah. Ah. And there's several of them. I'm only seeing them in that path. And there's those uh, spherical balls that uh, Chris Kelly was talking about that were seen on the Marianas dives and I, I also don't remember. Yeah, there's definitely something in there. You can see the edge of it. So my guess is that may be an irregular urchin like a sea biscuit or a hard urchin or something like that. Uh -huh. That's just below the sediment. Thank you, pilot. And maybe if we're lucky, we'll uh, get to see some that are exposed. There's a little, is that a cup coral? There's a little tiny structure there, so small. I'm pointing on the, uh, almost the center right side of the screen, now the upper right of the screen. There's a little tiny disc, and it's so small, we need not to zoom in on it. Oh, there's another nope, one. There you go. Absolutely. So there's a little coral or an anemone. Um, it would be almost directly right of the lasers. It's just on the upper side of that black rock that you see exposed, and it's kind of white. That's another thing I think we'll see down here. Very little color. Most things, I think, will be white or transparent. So how about that? Ah. I think I am happy with that. Thank you. Cool. Hey, Scott. It's Diva. Hi, Diva. So one more thing to note is that when you're working at these depths, especially, you know, in abyssal regions, um, especially so far west in the clarin Clipson zone, there isn't very much food because it's not very productive in the surface layers of the water. And so that means that a lot of the animals you see in this area tend to be really small. It's just something we've noticed from working in the eastern clarin Clipson zone, which has much, much more... Uh, food floating down from the surface layers. So I'm expecting to see much less life here in the western end of, of the carrying captain zone and, mu and very, very small things. Thank you, Diva. So, Diva, this material we see is, is rained down here. You think this is not the usual pattern? This is sort of a, a, a kind of a temporal uh, phenomenon to see this blue material, if, that, if that's what it is? Perhaps. I mean, this is super, uh, I guess, unexpected because it's typically known that in the uh, tropical eastern Pacific between Hawaii and uh, the western coast of the U.S., you, the ten productivity tends to decline as you move westward. Um, and so this is, yeah, really, really unexpected. And may perhaps temporal, but I mean, this just shows that why we need to explore these areas, because we're breaking down things that we thought were sort of paradigms, I guess. Right. I think that's a great, great, great point to make here this morning as we begin. Um, Del, I'm noticing that the bottom looks really different from anything that we've seen before. And so and we just passed an interesting um, sponge there on the left. Um, it looks like it's very flat and you can see it's exposed at places and kind of like these lineations in it. Um, Les Watling was suggested it looks like a rocky seafloor being slowly buried by Globigerina shells. That's a kind of foraminiferin, um, a few millimeters every thousand years. And if it's uh, that slow to accumulate, then the corals that we see aren't in any danger of being buried yet. Yeah, you kind of get the sense it's just the very top of these rocks, maybe. We could have a lot thicker sediment here than we've, we've seen in other places. But it's interesting to me how flat it is yeah. instead of uh, big outcrops. There was a little uh, bivalve shell on that little structure. 
I don't think it was a uh, clam. I think it may have been a brachiopod. Yeah, but here you can see what I mean. It's kind of like flat pavement. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. So. But definitely enough current down here to sort of keep these surfaces uh, swept clean. Yeah. Copy that, pilot. Thank you. What's going on right yeah, here? Yeah, so, huh. <laughs> I guess we just come up on this rock patch. Yeah, you get a little different perspective if you uh, well, what's, is swing this, the ROV around. Is this accumulated? That, pilot, is it possible to zoom in exactly where we are, this darker brown patch? Yeah, that really looks like this marine and rain snow stuff here. Yeah. It's really aggregated in this little patch. Oh, this is all these spherical that wow. uh, Chris was referring to. I think. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Uh, this is what I was referring to, the whole accumulation of these spherical something or others. Jeff, they think these are radiolarian tests that are filled with gold. Some of them are really dark. I see so there's... If you heard that, uh, Jeff thinks they're radiolarians. So there's four of them there that are almost a black with uh, shiny white dots in them. So radiolarians, you think? We saw we saw radiolarians like this underneath the California current upwelling seasonally, and you'd get these big uh, blooms of radiolarians in the upper water column with these all these siliceous spicules. They would sink to the seafloor and form mats. They would tangle with all kinds of other organic detritus, which is what this kind of looks like. Which is that, that's my reason for saying radiolarians. Very cool. Um, yeah. Thanks, and uh, that hey, sounds like a. Hang on a second, Diva. That sounds like Jeff Drazen, and um, you didn't introduce Sorry, yourself. Um, so, Jeff, could you introduce yourself, and then we will go to Diva, who I know has a comment about what we're seeing. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Jeff Drazen. I'm a professor in the oceanography department at UH. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, go ahead, Diva. So we saw lots of these on the Mariana cruise, particularly on uh, a fourth dive on Enigma Seamount, and it really stumped us. We didn't really know what it was. We tried to pick some up, and they kind of just, they were more solid than we were expecting, but they just were, we were able to crush them within the ROV manipulators. But then you're able to crush a lot of things within those ROV manipulators, so I guess that's not really a signifying <laughs> factor. But I, I spoke to a foraminifera expert about them because like, we weren't sure at all what they were, and... And we kind of ruled out, um, we ruled out radiolarians, and then Andy Goody from National Geography Center in Southampton in the UK said that he also doesn't think they're foraminifera. He said that, I'm looking at the mission log we wrote about it, and he says that although the size and shape are right for gromids, a type of foraminifera, they lack the typical smooth, shiny, reflective surfaces. He said these, the sizes of the spheres could are not, sorry, hold on. He thinks it's possible that these spheres are instead xenophyophores as the size matches and the system of polygonal cells is reminiscent of some xenophyophore tests. However, although xenophyophores are common on sea mounts, he's worried that they are too light and abundant for it to be found in the Marianas. And the fluffy matrix also really kind of confused him and, and they weren't like anything he'd ever seen. Komoki, um, which can form reticulated balls such as these, uh, are not usually this big and also don't really look like this. So he had other suggestions. Perhaps they were something pelagic that bloomed and then settled on the seafloor, or perhaps they were dead sponges. But basically, after talking to various experts during that expedition, we weren't able to come to any conclusions. Huh. Sorry, that's not very helpful, but just showing you the process that we worked Great. through, which was... We, getting, we, you know, away from forearms and getting away from radiolarians, I guess. We, we do have a, a scoop now that we were successful with picking up some sediments the other day. Um, is Would there be an interest to anyone unsure of, of grabbing some of this material, or do we think we have a good enough handle on it? We would yes, have everyone here at the UAGCC is saying collect some. Collect some, okay. We would have to put it in, in a bio box to, to hold it, but uh, we can we can see if we can do that. Uh, I think given that it's been a mystery for several expeditions now, it could be a good collection. All right, great. Uh, Pilot, let me know when you're settled in. There's a uh, request to try to scoop some of this material um, with shovel.
Yeah, that sort of fluffier looking stuff on top there. We can get a biggest scoop as possible, and we'll have to put that in one of the, the bio boxes, I think, to, to keep it. Yep. T take your time. I know you're just we're just I know you're just changing over here. So. Yeah, we're hearing. He we're, we're hearing from shore that it might might be uh, more congealed or har harder in that mat than some of the stuff just floating down now. But we d we don't know for sure. We have seen similar things on other d other dives elsewhere in the Pacific, and that's why we're we're interested. So, uh, Dell, as, as we're sitting here watching the pilots uh, get in a position for the scoop, I'm looking at this rock on the right-hand side, and at least on the bottom, it looks like it's been cut away or eaten away by some of the sediments, and, and that would indicate to me that there's at least been enough flow down here to, to erode some of that away. Yeah, per perhaps it is. Um, it, you know, it's two possibilities. We have seen some of the sort of undercutting in, in some areas from currents before. It may have just possible it just tumbled down from the slope that's off to the the left side of the screen here and sort of landed there um, we don't well I don't think we can say for sure from this angle but um, yeah there's kind of a little bit of out of place there um, compared to everything else aside of this level surface that we've been seeing Yeah, so we were able to use this scoop a few dives ago to pick up some sediment on uh, one of the sea mounts we were diving on. There it looked like um, mostly uh, foraminifera. And and so here we're going to try to pick up this um, somewhat di different looking mat. Um, we have been suggested maybe radiolarians, which are uh, uh, silicic um, uh, shells. Dell, you will have to email all of the scientists to let us know what it is. We'll 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 do. I'll uh, I'll take some photographs in the microscope. We can get those out, and it'd be great to have someone identify the uh, what's there. We've been we've been using a new microscope here on the ship quite a bit. 
with our sample collection. So it's been been really great to have those images and um, put them into the the database uh, right away. It helps us identify things on the ship, and um, I think it'll be a great resource for for folks um, on shore as they continue to mine these data. Huh. It really is, isn't it? <laughs> it's like cotton balls or something. Like that. Yeah, if we can get that over to the box, that would be fabulous. That was great. I don't want to come off now. <laughs> I think we're going to enjoy playing with this sample when it comes up. It has some very interesting physical properties. So. All right. Yeah, we don't we don't need a whole lot. Do so. we think we got uh, enough of the balls in there, or is it mostly the white underlying sediment? Well, that is. We that, try another scoop. Yeah, pilot. Can we can we try one more scoop? I guess there's a there's a concern that the balls floated up there, and we were left with the lighter sediment. Um, it's a little hard to. Yeah, yeah. That that'd be great. Just what, since we've we've come this far, might as well make sure we get a good good sample. Uh, going much more shallow approach. Well, tell them. Oh. No, they're doing it. See, he's moving the steam.
That is an awesome scoop. <laughs> Yeah, maybe our best bet is to get some of those balls buried by the other sediment that might keep them in there, I guess. Awesome. Thanks so much. You put a dustpan on the end of a multi-million dollar robot, you can do anything. That's what I always say. Awesome. So now what, what people need to invent is the uh, deep sea Roomba. <laughs> yeah, we just put an army of those. Turn them loose. <laughs> Go ahead now. That's correct. That's uh, spec zero one geo.
Alright. Yeah, I guess we got a, a shrimp here. Or what is this? Can we can we do a quick zoom on this? Yeah. So what do we think? Is this the same species that we've been seeing at shallow depths or something new? I'm waiting for one of the people to chime in who knows our shrimp, Chris <laughs> or Diva and all, but it's definitely not the same species that we were seeing on the uh, dives in the last couple of days. Um, it's a Aristeus or um, what used to be called Plasiopeneus um, shrimp, but I can't remember what the characters are to identify those. Uh, Ceratops, yeah, other genus. Um, in the eastern CCZ, we were seeing one which, I mean, Astrid would be much better placed to answer this, Astrid or Jess, but on our um, eastern CCZ, we, no bones in the fish, please. we saw, um, it was Plesiopeneus armatus was the species we saw. Whether that's also this one, I'm not sure, but that's the best I've got. Uh, did you guys hear that request there from uh, Craig Smith and Jeff Drazen? Uh, there's not only a fish, but Craig thinks there might be some whale bones on the bottom. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, I didn't hear. So there we the go. Vital... The fish was up close on the right, as were the whale bones. Up close on the right, okay. Right. To the right, the elongated structures, I think, is what he was looking at. Oh. Uh. I think, sorry, I think we're, we're moving now. We'll keep an eye out here. Okay, so the geology is just so strange. I mean, everything about this dive is totally not what I was expecting so far. Great, so really, the, really fascinating. So, pilot, there was a uh, someone thought they saw some whale bones. It was, would it be back to the the right, though? I guess I don't know if it's possible to spin back around. If we have time. There's a fish there, I guess so. Or what is this? <laughs> oh. Yeah. That's an empty head. So this is a sea cucumber holotherian. That's a, that's a very odd way of moving about in the water column. So while I was inclined to say initially that this was an Epiastes, which is one of the most common um, swimming sea cucumbers, 
I actually think that uh, Penny Agony Leander, um, it, it is known to swim uh, quite often, but not as often as Inipiastes, Inipiastes, sorry. And um, it's one we've also seen in the Eastern Clarion Clifton Zone, but it's really great to see some footage of it swimming. Yeah, I um, think. Live, I guess. Great. I think these might be the bones here, or is that just marks? Nope, that's just. I think it's just trails. Did anyone see the the bones you're referring to? Yeah, and the lower right looks like could be bones. Correct, lower right. Oh. Well, we're frozen here, so give us a moment. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Give a shout out if someone someone sees uh, sees it again here from shore. Um, we got a couple minutes here before the. Um, I, I think you're right. Yeah. And so it, it was just to the right. Then they said of that. I th I think. Yeah. Um. Right. All right. Uh, all right. I'm not seeing it, so um, I guess we can go ahead and uh, move, pilot. When it, can move when you're ready, pilot. I I agree. We can go ahead and, and head on up. We'll keep our eyes open for whale bones as we go. That's it right ahead. Can you zoom in on that stuff? And there's the fish. Could you stop and yeah, zoom in on this? Could be manganese encrusted bones. So we're having a look at so the. I think this is an ophidian and maybe Lucicorus, but the eyes are causing us to breathe here. Yeah, this fish looks like it's got a damaged head. Um, I'm not sure if it's intact, if the eyes are I'll intact. I, you know, you're right, it does look like Lucicorus. I don't know what a Bisselbrachula looks like, uh, but it's a very strange-looking um, very strange looking head on this. Yeah, Bruce, we were saying here that it looks like that one side there isn't even an intact eye anymore, but on the other side you can still see its eye. Yeah, it looks wow. like it's got uh, you know pits on the top of the skull. Something's really attacked this fish or damaged this fish. It's in bad shape. Uh, I I think it is a Lucicorus. Uh, we've seen model ones like this before, uh, blotchy ones. It's obviously an Opidian, um, and everything about it is right except for the eye. And it looks like something's really uh, chomped on the head of this animal. So Bruce, what would do something like this to a fish? I am just amply baffled by this. Yeah, me too. Uh, the only thing that comes to mind is maybe one of the big semaphobranchid eels. Bruce, what about a babby 
That's another possibility, yes. Boy, it really looks like something has bitten this the head of this fish very badly. So I think I heard, uh, this is Scott, I'm back from lunch, and I think I heard on shore uh, maybe Craig Smith's voice and asking about possible manganese encrusted bones. So if you could give me some sense of uh, where you were looking um, so we could try to reacquire that. Oh, I see. Yeah, on that patch of rock, I mean, is it darker black? Uh, can we look uh, just to the uh, outer left? Yeah, we were looking at this uh, schizopathies earlier. <coughs> so off the screen, upper left, on top there, that looks like a... Yeah, you see that the thing that's sitting up on top of the rock almost looks like it has the structure of a vertebra. I don't know if it's too large. I know it's got an opening in the center. Looks like a couple of wings on the right. Oh, no, I see. That's not an opening. I was just fooled by the shadow. Okay. If that's bone, it's been there an awful long time. Looks like it's part of the pavement. Thank you, pilot. So I understand there was at least one image while I was gone. I'm not sure if it was this one or not, but this is a sea cucumber, a deposit feeder, exactly what we might expect to find down at these depths on these soft sediments. I noticed when we were zooming in there, a couple of uh, uh, what look like uh, xenophyophores, um, forams that are building, uh, foraminifera that are building these uh, tests that look like little white foliaceous plates. And I just saw here, um, Annie showed me in the video replay, the sea cucumber that had been seen earlier, and that was different from the one we were just looking at. So we've got at least two species of uh, holothurian sea cucumber. I have to say I'm really kind of surprised at the way the bottom looks here. This is not what I was expecting. Um, well, is it an anemone or a cup coral here? It's probably an anemone. I think it's an anemone on a sponge stalk right there and there's one of those forums in the background yeah i noticed there's going to be a sponge in the foreground left as you're coming back uh, you would yeah i think it's oh uh, maybe yeah not sure if now that's a sponge or another one of the black corals oh it's another one of these black corals okay you can really see the way the branches hang down and uh, kind of curl together and um, i imagine they kind of create a nice little funnel and the water has to pass through that funnel and over all the polyps that are on the branches hanging down thank you it's a black coral, probably genus Schizopathias. Understood.
really kind of ropey looking bottom here, uh, just lightly dusted with sediments. There was a large fish to the right, if you rotate back to the right. Okay. Did in the distance. We'll see what we can do. We're having to uh, make a move here to catch up, but we'll try to... There it is, approaching the center now. Yeah, it's pretty far off. So this is another Cusky uh, family Ophidiidae. My guess is from the shape, the rounded head, and the relatively small eye that it's in the genus Basozetus, and there are several species in that genus. Uh, so, Jeff and Astrid, what do you think? Yep. Yep, we concur. Basozetus. Thank you, Pilot. We have an idea on the fish. Basozetus. Please do. All right, well, uh, this is Dan Rogers uh, in the pilot seat, and we have Bobby Moore as nav, and Fernando Aragon as co-pilot, Roland Bryan in the video chair, and Emily Nero back in the highlight uh, clipping chair. And we're all engineers and videographers with the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. This is uh, Jeff over in the UHDCC. We were wondering if there are any geologists who might be able to comment on the on the stripes and and sort of uh, geologic features, which are just really so striking in this dive. Can we have a look at the uh, white stuff? Um, yeah, Dell has just gone down to lunch, so he can't comment. But if there's any other uh, geologists who are on the line, it looks like trash. It looks like a nylon bag or something to that effect. Onion sack. So definitely something man-made. Just coming into the lower left, your skid just went over it, it's blocked, and I'm not sure if that's a, a hole, a rock, uh, it, I think it's just the angle, it's just another rock, that's fine, thank you, yep, I thought it might have been a burrow with something in the front of the burrow, it's just the angle. Yeah, those spherules. Yep. Yeah, so we've had a couple of questions wondering about uh, what look like these uh, ropey. Could, Go ahead. If I can interrupt, there's there's a Macrura. There's a large Macrura in the uh, Sirius view, hovering between uh, Sirius and uh, D2. Yeah, it looks a little bit high. I'm not sure that we're going to get that in the uh, camera one view, but we can at least get a video clip perhaps from the Sirius camera. It looks like one of the large Corypheinoidae species, either Armatus or Yaquinae. And I'm seeing a black disc-like object at about So, Pilot, I see three things in view all in the upper left quadrant. Um, one is a dark object, and then looks like there's a white ring, and then there's a bluish gray further left of that. So. Okay. No problem. There is a stick just underneath the lasers now to the... Lower left of the lasers. Yep. Understand. Mm -hmm. Now it's above and to the right. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm not sure what it was a stick of. It could have been one of those uh, black corals. We've seen several schizopathies, but uh, it is now dead and been uh, colonized with what look like possible uh, hydroids. There may also be some polychaetes that have built some tubes there. And as we pull back, I may have passed over a very small anemone also in the foreground. Yep, it's on one of these uh, ropey, the, the closest ropey lava just to the right of the lasers. There's a small white either anemone or cup coral. So I think we're going to be, yeah, it's an anemone. Yeah, so this is good. I, I think we saw one earlier at another angle and couldn't quite tell, but now we can clearly see that that's an anemone. And you can see it's really small. That's going to be uh, the case for a lot of the uh, cecil fauna that we see down here at this depth. Our depth right now is 4,571 meters, so four and a half kilometers deep. It's just over two and a half miles under the ocean surface. Um, no, it was an anemone, and um, if you're stable, we can get another look, but uh, I'm okay to go on. Thank you. Understood. Yeah. Yeah, so pilot, if you want a little bit later, be interested to know what sort of current you're um, sensing where it's moving. We don't usually see strong currents down here, but clearly there's something keeping this uh, rock exposed. There's a fish in the upper left far in the distance. Or maybe worse, that's still too far to go. Okay. Uh, I think this may be the Basicetus that we just imaged a few minutes ago. Yep, that looks like another bad Thank you, Astrid. Yep. And just to the left, it looks like there's a really big hyalinema, maybe, um, as well as a quite large, oh, and another black coral, as well as to the left, there was um, quite a large xenophyphal. Thanks, Diva. Yeah, I saw those as we were zooming in, the uh, black coral and then the xenophyphal. It's kind of like an upright, erect uh, plate, foliaceous plate. Makes me think of um, some of the... Um, yeah, it's not here in the center. I think it's to the right. Let's see. I don't see it right now, Pilot. I've seen several of them. There's another one of those uh, swimming cucumbers that you had imaged earlier. I've seen several, so I'm not worried that we're not going to see another one again. So I'll give you some advance notice. Yeah, I said uh, we've seen several. I don't see it right now, so I wouldn't worry. I, I wouldn't. I would expect to see it again, so we don't have to go searching for it. This is new, though. This um, sea star, resinged sea star. We'll get a little bit more information, perhaps from uh, Chris Kelly. Okay, thank you, Astrid. So we're looking at um, a sea star, a relative or a kind of sea star. It's in the uh, order Brasingida, and these are sea stars that feed from the water column. So you see its arms are raised off the bottom. You can see the upper part of the oral disc, that center circle. The mouth is underneath, and it's got a bunch of these spines sticking out. And you can kind of see that the spines look thick. There's a tissue on the spines, and the tissue has uh, various little hooks that can uh, grasp onto stuff that's floating by. And then on the underside of the arms, there are tube feet that will transfer what is captured to the mouth underneath. So this is a sea star that is adapted for fishing out of the water column. I do not. Oh, yeah, drifting there? Yeah. Good luck with that. Oh, there we go. I th I'm wondering if it's a ketignath, actually, and not a fish, an arrow worm had the right shape. Thank you, pilot. <laughs> no.
No, that's good because you alert us to them. Feel free. Um, so Dell's back from lunch, and Dell, we were having some questions about the overall geology here and these interesting sort of lineation patterns and just been discussing about whether there's uh, uh, lava flows possible in this area. Um, do you have any uh, general comments that you can make? Yeah, I mean, the whole upper part of the ocean crust is made up of an intrusive layer, and these are these would be um, l lava flows, and it's possible to sort of, it almost looks like kind of channels you can still see poking out of the sediments here, these sort of long lines. So it's possible, yeah, this was flowing um, from a spreading center uh, millions of years ago, 100 million years ago, 120 million years ago, and that could be some of the patterns that we're, we're seeing here, just barely poking out. So what I understand about the geology, if that were the case and this was um, representative of flows from the spreading center, why wouldn't it be covered in the sediments by now? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, obviously it isn't, so um, um, it could be that we're down here by this fracture zone and may have st stronger currents than expected. Um, we are probably maybe just below that carbonate compensation depth that we talked about earlier. Um, and so it could be we're not accumulating anything that has a calcium carbonate shale is actually dissolving. That could make our um, sediment lower. And also it could be that lots of the stuff that's raining down here is getting eaten. Um, yeah, I was, I was expecting uh, thicker sediment here um, on, this, on this low sloping part as well. So um, it's a surprising and a little exciting that we can actually see some of these rocks still outcropping. Great. So we might uh, expect to see a change in the, uh, the bottom here, moving up slope a bit. <coughs> sure. Let's have a look at the one on the rock that's just left, uh, just right of center. Let's see. There's a little stock. And again, I'm guessing that this is. Oh yeah, little mycid shrimp. So I'm guessing this was a black coral that has died and it's been overgrown now by. A variety of fouling organisms, probably hydroids. It looks like a couple of barnacles, but that's a mycid shrimp, also called a possum shrimp. So that's be something to be swimming around. Oh, and there's a really nice view of the Xena 5 4 that uh, Diva had uh, called in before. So the structure behind and to the right of the upright stock, that it looks like it's composed of uh, sand or mud, and it is. It's a single celled organism, and it's able to sort of glue those particles together. And the cell is kind of dispersed throughout the interior there, and it extends uh, pseudopods, which are extensions of the cell in order to uh, pick up organic particles. Nice view. And again, these black corals are really common here, and I'm just trying to verify that I'm identifying them correctly. Hey, Spotted Siva. Hi, Diva. I have a really interesting fact about Xenophonic Great. So uh, a team of us were doing some work, Craig and Jeff included, who are at the University of Hawaii ECC, um, in the eastern clearing Clipperton Zone. <clears throat> and the forearm expert who was working with us, Dr. Andy Goody, he did a study on the Xenophonic in that one area of the eastern CCZ, the, the claim area that was leased to the UK Seaboard Resources Limited, a company, um, which is part of the UK. Anyway... Uh, basically, they connect, collected 36 morpha species of Xenophyophore during two expeditions, and they found that 34 of those 36 were new species to science. Wow. That just shows how little we know about Xenophyophores, especially in abyssal areas. Yeah, they're so hard to collect. So, Diva, I've been talking here on the board uh, to some of the other folks about Xenophyophores and the difficulty of collecting them, and my experience is that you know, the best way to get them is using a box core because you're not uh, disrupting the sediment around them. So uh, is that how you guys were collecting them in the uh, further east? Exactly. So we tried to use an Ekman grab once, um, and that just didn't work. And so all of the Xenophyphores that Andy and his team managed to collect were using a box core, and that's a pretty effective tool. Great. So a box core is basically a uh, kind of a big square shovel. Oh, there's a medusa that's uh, drifting by. That's a hydromedusa. Nice view of that. This is uh, basically, it's a jellyfish that is related to the hydrozoans. It's in the class hydrozoa. 
Thank you. So a fairly strong current moving from northeast to southwest. Thanks, pilot. There's an interesting feeding, or it might be a fecal trace or a feeding trace in the upper right of the screen. You can see it looks like white squiggly lines. You're extended? Okay, we can wait. Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's like crop circles. <laughs> it's a lot like crop circles. So again, something is making its way through the sediment, munching on the sediment, and you can see that uh, these are raised, so I would love to hear from uh, Diva or Craig about um, do you believe these may be some kind of a regular urchin that's embedded in the sediment? Or do you believe that uh, the feeding is actually the furrows between the uh, clear parts? See, whatever this is it is. Craig, I think it's an irregular urchin burrowing just above the sediment water interface. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks, Craig. So we did a zoom on uh, some of these before. Hey, and just to chime in, yep. uh, during our work in the Eastern CTV, we actually saw about nine species of echinoids, and at least three of those were irregular burrowing urchins, which would leave similar tracks like that. So I agree with Craig, probably an irregular urchin or regular, but regardless, a burrowing urchin. So really pleased to hear that from the both of you. We saw uh, some of these feeding traces when we first got down and we did a zoom on them and it did look like in parts of these um, uh, traces there were these little mounds at the end of them and uh, that's basically what we suggested that they might be, you know, sea biscuits, uh, sea potatoes, that kind of thing. The irregular urchins, the type that are adapted to burrow into the sediment instead of moving over the surface of the sediment. Yeah. Do we know anything about how quickly something like this would have formed? Is this an urchin's life work that I'm looking at, or is this something they would have done in a matter of days or weeks? Or Do we have any sense of that? Yeah, great question. That's, again, for Craig or Dave to answer. I would say weeks, that's a guess. And I was going to default to Craig on that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Weeks it is then. Uh, weeks it is, we'll say. Huh? That's interesting. Yeah. Thanks. So we said it a, a few times, but, you know, it might as well be repeated here since we're talking about these uh, burrowing urchins that a lot of the animals that you're going to see here on this deep sea floor in this muddy area are taking advantage of organic particles that have settled onto the sea floor and so are basically going to be ingesting the uh, sediments along with the organics and digesting that. And you see evidence that they've been there because of uh, these traces. Yeah, what's uh, the dark spot surrounded by the light sediment? Almost looks like some kind of cephalopod from huh. here, but. So we're saying it's probably sea cucumber, a holotherian. We get a zoom on that. Wow. Yeah. You're right. It is a sea cucumber. That's a nice one. I haven't seen this one before. Uh, Craig or Diva, do you want to describe this one? Looks like it's got a sail. Exactly. So this is a species called Cycropotes longicorda. And it's very, very distinct because it's quite large in size. Um, it's got this very distinct sail, which you can see coming off of the end of it uh, on the closer end towards us. And it's also yellow. Now, it has a sort of sister species, Cycropotes semperiana, which is, looks very similar, but is purple. But this is probably one of the most distinct species that we get in the clarion Cupton zone. So, Diva, it looks like it's um, feeding in. The other in thing it. you can see is a grazing trace around it. The lighter colored sediment is where it's been surface deposit feeding. It's removed the, the kind of greenish stuff from the surface. So, yeah, Craig, that's exactly what I was just going to refer to. And it's interesting that this is kind of in a circular pattern, one big circle instead of in a line. Is that typical for this species? I, I don't know. I would. Presumably, it's richer in this little patch, so it's using optimal foraging or somewhat optimal foraging to find to feed on the, the best quality sediment. Great, thank you. 
I have read uh, some papers that say that some of these cucumbers will uh, preferentially ingest sediments that have higher levels of organics than others. So if they find a good patch to feed in, there's no need to go on that sort of long walkabout. Thought maybe he was just less artistic than the other other one there. So. <laughs> well, that's another interpretation. <laughs> I don't know if uh, Diva mentioned this, but that sail is actually can be used as a sail. They can put it up in the water column, and then currents can cause them to bounce along the bottom, just along the bottom, till presumably they find a richer patch, and then they put the sail down and and feed locally until they want to go to another location, and then can drift along with that sail. So, Craig, am I interpreting the anatomy of this one correctly? The mouth is at the end facing us with the hood, and I see what looks like an opening on the uh, dorsal surface at the other end. We're looking at the hind end right now. Oh, so what's the opening then at the uh, other end? It looks like there's an opening on the dorsal surface. Maybe it's not an opening. This is the, that's the head end up there, the forward end that we're looking at now. Okay, so there's a, yeah, there's a dark, dark little uh, raised blotch uh, between some of those small modified tube feet. I guess that's what fooled me. Thanks, Craig. Hmm. Yeah, Diva, what do you think? It looks like the sail may have had the end bitten off. It looks like it's truncated. What do you think? I totally agree and was just about to say that. So the sail looks, as Craig just said, the sail looks like it should have been much longer. It usually doesn't have that blunt end to it. It's usually much more rounded. So this could have been um, prey to some larger animal, perhaps. That larger animal is probably a fish. <laughs> environments you'll have the fishes forming the top predator of the of the ecosystem so this could be a really cool example of uh, possible predation on the holothurian so does the finding holothurians with sails and give some Zoom indication fish, of, that there's a high current speed a low current speed typically or mixed i wonder if there's any any indications or um Ideas you can come up with based on if you see a preponderance of holothurians with sails on a given dive. It probably means very low current velocities in general. Um, if there's any significant current, they just get blown away and can't stay on the bottom. So we're looking now at one of these mercurid fishes, the rat tails that we were talking about earlier in the stereo feed. And we'd say this one is probably Corifinoides, these common abyssal uh, genus down there. And this one, based on kind of that skinny sloping head, maybe Corifinoides akine. Really nice view of it. <laughs> this, is one of, this is one of Jeff's uh, favorite groups of fish, so uh, I'll let Jeff uh, talk about these. He knows far more about them than I do. Uh, well, Mackenzie already provided a nice introduction there. That that was probably Corifinoides ekine. Uh, these there's two species, uh, Corifinoides armatus and Corifinoides ekine, which are are larger. <laughs> and, uh, there, it's really giving us a nice show, um, and uh, are often dominant across stretches, dominant fishes across stretches of, of abyssal habitat. Um, it's interesting, though. More frequently, we find these Corifinoides in in on along the margins of the gyres. Um, and so I guess it's not so surprising because we're here at the equator with, with much higher productivity. And when you, you move into the gyres, then you get uh, a much greater dominance of the, of the cusk eels or the uh, ocitiform. But these guys are definitely the top predators that Astrid was just mentioning a bit ago. Uh, we've done some diet work on these guys. They don't seem to eat a whole lot of sea cucumbers, but I suppose it's another species that might have taken a bite at that cusk eel we saw earlier with the damaged head. I would also guess that uh, the 
is probably close. You know, you get Tina because of the very well, small scale, which is a diagnostic characteristic. So you guys are really hard to tell apart. Hello. 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 Hello.
There's another Ipnops here on the lower left, what we were just imaging. Uh. Looks like it's uh, only maybe 12 centimeters. There's another one further left. So we just heard Jeff Drazen say they're really abundant. Um, in abyssal plains that they've been working in. I think we've seen four or five at least now. So we're at 4,563 meters. We're uh, just working our way up the base of this uh, slope feature that we were planning to see today, hoping uh, it's a fracture zone. And the bottom temperature is about 1.3 degrees Celsius. What about the dark object just going off the right side of the screen? Yep. Thank you. Another uh, holothurian. Yeah, so this may have been what you were imaging swimming early on, but uh, I wasn't here. I'll let the folks on shore let us know. Definitely another sea cucumber that has a sail. Yep. Understood, pilot. Roger. Scott, I think this might be a penny agony or an amperima. One of the two. They look really similar and really hard to distinguish without specimens. But one of those two, I'll put it. Great. Thanks, Diva. Penny Agony or Amparina, those are uh, genus names for that sea cucumber. You can see it also had one of the uh, sails or fins that uh, Craig Smith was talking about earlier that could catch a current and allow it to be carried from one place to another. Yeah, so we're just starting to get a look at the base of the slope here in the in the fracture zone. So we're expecting we might see some more exposures of rock here as we get up on the slope. Okay, so we have a little bit more time to look in the uh, soft bottom here before we get to those rocks. So perhaps, Pilot, uh, just going off towards the left of center, I see a white patch, a small white circle. Every once in a while, we can look at one of these and see if uh, one of these urchins has um, actually broken the surface. Not quite. Not mm -hmm. quite. Thank you. Okay, video, I have you uh, open so I can hear you. So these little white patches look, look fairly isolated to me. Are these urchins able to get up and uh, leave their burrows and move around, or how do um, they move 
not to my knowledge. Uh, maybe uh, Craig or Diva, if you want to give us a little bit more information on the uh, sort of the basic natural history of these burrowing urchins. But my sense is that if they're up on the surface, it's probably not a good thing. I think they spend most of their time burrowing, but would love to be educated myself. Uh, looks like uh, Diva to be up to you. Craig is not in the uh, Exploration Command Center at the moment. Yeah, so it's got um, a lot of the uh, irregular urchins or burrowing urchins, which we saw during our ROV and AUV transects in the eastern CCZ, were mostly, we just see tracks, and then you could just see the outline of them at the end of one of the tracks. But it was really, really difficult to actually image any of the animals. And it wasn't until I think we did a box call that we just happened to get a tiny spatangoid uh urchin called a cest of the box cores, and it was burrowed beneath the surface. Oh, huh. so um, then it sounds unlikely we'll see them. Two other irregular urchins, a sister crepus and an echino crepus. And again, we'd only see the tracks and then maybe a tiny glimmer of them just below the surface because that's where they get most of their food from. They, they tap into the deeper layers of sediment where there's maybe a lot of organic matter that perhaps is bioturbated down or mixed down by other echinoderms. Great. Thank you, Diva. Um, when you say tiny, can you give us a sense of uh, the diameter of the test? So the assess um, that we collected was only a mass of centimeters. I think perhaps three centimeters at most. Wow. So really it's small. quite small. But yeah. then a couple in the... Yeah, so that was that one's quite tiny, but then the echinocrepus was about 10 centimeters long, and the sister crepus uh, was about six or seven wow. centimeters long. But we didn't manage to collect any of those, so it's only seen in imagery. Great, thank you. Um, can we zoom in just above the lasers now? Yep. Because that looks open a little bit. No, just maybe a little bit fresher. Looks like it's maybe turned over a little bit more recently, but still elusive. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, Dell, I'm noticing that the character of the uh, rock bottom has changed. Here. Yeah, we've hit this steeper part of the slope here. It'd be great to get a zoom in on some of the, the rocks if we see a, a good surface here. Oh, yeah, there's uh, to the left of the lasers there some. Is that just uh, more radial errands piled up? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I don't know about the pile, but I see yeah. one drifting. Maybe something white on the rock down there. Top. Oh, yeah, so there's oh, a yeah. holothurian just above the lasers to the right, slightly purple in color. We can get a quick look at that. And we'll see the rock as well. Yep. <laughs> Bonus. Bonus. <laughs> Very efficient here. Yes, please. This looks a little bit Adele, different, what do you Diva. What's going on with the geology right here? We're going to describe the geology right after you tell us about this sea cucumber. This is from the genus Olfenergus, which is perhaps one of the most hilarious to pronounce Holothurian names. And we have seen plenty of them in the eastern CCZ. They may not be the same species, but definitely the same genus. Great. Thank you, Diva. Yep, they're doing it, Roland. Yeah, so we got a little look at the rocks there. Um, looks like even at, at these depths, a lot of what we're seeing right on the surface are these uh, ferromagnetic crusts that we've been been seeing all, all over uh, in this region. So that's sort of covering the rock here. We mentioned during our introduction that we're uh, in a fracture zone. And uh, it's and those fracture zones run parallel uh, to the direction of plate motion, but as plate motion changes a little bit, things can get pulled apart or pushed up. And we typically call these areas tectonic windows. And uh, so there are some of these back on active transform faults that are recently exposed, where we get this nice cross-section of the ocean crust. And so we're probably under this manganese crust, we'd expect to see something similar here, where we might actually come in at the base of this cliff and be looking at intrusive rocks. 
And as we work our way up section here, we may see um, ancient uh, dike, dike intrusions and then more extrusive rocks. If we were to get all the way up to the surface, which are the ridge here, we won't today. Uh, we may see more extrusive rocks. Um, but the kind of morphology that we're seeing, a lot of that here has to do with this iron manganese crust right now. But we probably underneath this would be rocks that actually would have been intruded and, and cooled um, probably beneath the surface if this is in fact a ridge that's popped up along along this long fracture zone, which is, which is what it appears to be. Getting a nice diversity of sea cucumbers today, much as uh, we predicted we might. I'm standing by for your comments, Diva. I'm not sure with this one. <laughs> Perhaps from the family Cinelac today. That's what I would have the guessed. Row, the even rows of of um, papillae on the on the dorsal surface. Wow. Okay. Were these blooms blown around? Maybe we should move away. <laughs> Yeah, you can see they're uh, very lightweight, light-bodied organisms. Get caught up in the uh, thruster wash here. The lasers here are about 10 centimeters apart for scale, so yeah, this one might make 20 centimeters or yeah. something. Yep, I think so. Thank you. Yep, we are. And just for a, a note for you on shore, I'm not sure if the information was relayed, but uh, it looks like the Sirius uh, sonar isn't up, and so the pilot is bringing the uh, d Deep Discover ROV up off the bottom every once in a while, four or five meters, so we can use the uh, sonar to see out ahead of us and get an idea of how steep the slope is. So if you're wondering why we're sort of going up and down like that, uh, that's the answer. Uh, there is a sea star on the face of a rock on the left of the lasers. I think it may be different from the one that we saw earlier. This looks like another uh, Brasingid, I believe. So another one of these sea stars that feeds out of the water column by holding its arms up. Uh, but I thought that last one may have had more arms than what I'm looking at here. Six arms. Far left edge. Um, just below the lasers now, the uh, sea star. Thank you. Doesn't look like anything loose here, Del. No. <laughs> uh, looks like you know some of this may have come down the slope at one point, but it's been more or less all crusted in. So uh, we'll keep our eyes out for a rock, of course, but it may be easier said than done today. Well, despite what Astrid is saying, I'm pretty sure this is a Brasingid sea star, uh, but it may have fewer arms than the one we saw before. Uh, you can see the kind of swollen bases of uh, the upper part of the arms. I wonder if that says something about uh, reproductive state. Huh, yeah, I see that. Might be some uh, eggs stuck up in there. I'm not entirely certain. I don't know the biology of this group all that well. Uh, but you can clearly see here these spines that are covered with tissue and they're bulbous at the end. And again, that tissue that's on those spines has all of these little uh, hooks for uh, capturing its food, basically. Capturing prey and then they're transferred using the tube feet to the mouth. Thank you, pilot. That's good. So, Scott, I don't know if Chris Ma will call in, but um, with the work we've been doing in the eastern clarion cutting zone, <laughs> Sort of this rule that, well, a rough rule that Chris Ma gave us that said that if there were six arms, then it tended to be in the genus Freyastera, and if there were more than six arms, then they would be in the genus Freyella. Sorry about the dog. <laughs> he agrees, I think. <laughs> so, 
I think I didn't catch the last genus name with the dog bark. <laughs> but thank you for that, Diva. Uh, let's see. So there, I'm going to keep my eye out here. There were some bright white uh, sort of golf ball-like structures that were over here. Yeah. There's some that are really tiny on the rock there. Let's see, yeah, on that large black rock face, yeah. So pilot, if you're in a position, the uh, largest dark face of a rock that's facing us above the lasers, there's a, a few white things protruding from it. Let's check out to see if those are sponges. There may actually also be a worm on the left lower side of that same rock face. So it's higher up on this rock face. Yep. Oh, it's on the yeah the the big flat. There's obviously something has been scouring this rock down below. You could see. Um, no, I think you still have to come out. We're st it's still higher. What I was looking at. No problem. Um, well, let's look at the tube. What I'm I don't see it now. That's so the. Yeah, let's look at the focus on the tube that's on the lower left. And then, yeah, there's, looks like maybe that's the base of a sponge or something above it, but we'll start with that tube. Yes, I do. Thank you. It's Video. All, all tubes. Yeah. That's a long one yeah. right here. So, you know, my first instinct usually when I see tubes on rocks is to think polychaete, but I'm not entirely convinced that this is a polychaete tube. So we'll wait to see or hear from some of the other abyssal experts. You can see there's it's incorporated a lot of uh, the probably these uh, foraminiferal shells that are being used. So I think that was a chitin. So if you can get stable, I'm really interested in what's above we don't have to get closer. We didn't get a view on it. It was above the, uh, yep, just to the right of the laser now, yep. So I'm pretty sure this is a chitin. I was going to suggest when we saw that cleared space on the right. rock, there oh. might be a chitin. Because yep. that's what we saw, what, four or five dives ago. Yeah. And sure enough. There we go. There we go. So uh, polypocophora, the class polypocophora in the uh, mollusca. So this is related to the snails. Common name is chitin. You can see there's a series of uh, valves or plates. There's usually seven or eight plates. And it's surrounded by this thick muscular girdle. And then it has a foot underneath it. And between the girdle and the foot, there are channels on either side of the body. And it can use the combination of the muscular foot and that girdle to kind of clamp itself down to the rock so it doesn't get uh, washed away. They're mm. very common in shallow water, um, exposed, uh, wave-swept beaches. Great. So clearly there are also some uh, deep sea ones. A nice sense there. You see where the ROV skids hit the uh, sediments and exposed underneath. So you can see the difference between the flocculent material that's uh -huh. laying on top and the color of the sediments underneath. Yeah, it doesn't look like this flocculent material ever really built, builds up. Even as we, we d dig down there, the sediments look very uniform um, beneath that layer. Um, no, no, that rock face? No, when we got in, I wasn't seeing anything that was really definable. Um, as a sponge, I mean. That's what I was looking for. Encrusting sponges.
All right, so we're just coming into the kind of steeper part of the, the slope here, at least according to our, our shipboard uh, bathymetry. We should have a similar slope here as we go up the, the rest of the dive, I, w I would imagine. What's in the center? Let's see, it's the right quadrant of the screen. I'm looking at rocks almost touching the top of the screen, and it looks like there's some white trails coming down from them. Thank you. I don't know if these are more of these same kind of tubes that we were just looking at. This looks like almost like ophiroid arms down on that one. Yeah, some of those skinny tubes can almost look like that before, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so yeah. there's clearly something that's taking the sediments here and consolidating it together into a tube. And there are various crustaceans that will do this, amphipods will do this, uh, worms will certainly do this. I don't believe that there would be a foraminifera that would be, make tubes this large, but I don't absolutely know that. Um, Diva on shore or anybody else uh, have any familiarity with these sorts of constructions? I may take that as a no. There's a little <laughs> tiny anemone there on the uh, just left of center screen. Really small. A little bluish gray thing. Wow. So we have seen some of those larger, kind of has the same sort of appearance to it. So I imagine that's just a relatively recent recruit. Larva settled, began to turn into anemone. And if there's enough food that comes by here, we'll grow into a much larger one. Hmm. Thank you, pilot. It's good. Diva is sparing us the uh, barking dog, but she does inform <laughs> us that she's not familiar with these tubes either. But I can yeah. see them all over the rocks there. There's some more dark traces in the rocks. Uh, so yeah. There must be uh, another yeah. chitin up there, or those are left from the chitin that uh, we had seen down below. Also on the yeah, rock all, that the lasers over, are pointing. Yeah. In fact, I see the chitin on the rock that the lasers just point uh, yeah. one over. So this is really cool, because we'd seen this on many dives, these traces, but we hadn't seen who was responsible for it. So it was kind of exciting what three, four, five, it's all blurring together. Uh, but on this expedition, yeah. <laughs> on this leg, we finally did see the chitin at the end of the trail. Yeah, up at the top of the, the ridge at the, near the end, we, we saw that one. Oh, uh, so was that the Cook Islands dive, I maybe? Think, I think so, yeah. yeah the high seas yeah. Uh, ridge. Um, yeah, video, that's exactly what we were just uh, saying. I think we think it was on the uh, ridge on... Uh, in the high seas just north of the Cook Islands. Huh, look at that. This is not at all what I expected to see today. Yeah, a lot of this you know, texture we're seeing again is, is this manganese crust. And this piece of the seafloor would have formed, you know, 120 million years ago or more. more. So this has been uh, sitting here more or less exposed, you know, not covered with sediments for a long time. So these. Not surprising we haven't seen a lot of loose rocks. It looks like they're really crusted in. There's a white circle um, going to the edge of the right screen now, about halfway up. That's probably a larger version of one of these anemones that we just saw that I mentioned might be a recruit. I also see a couple of the uh, black corals that we were imaging before mm. on the left side of the screen. And I think maybe the lasers are just passing through another one. Actually, those might be just tubes on the front of the rock. Yep. Yeah, there we go. Uh, interesting thing about this anemone, what I'm seeing is how much that oral disc is depressed around those tentacles. Often they're much uh, more level. I don't know what that means. Mm. Hasn't fed in a while, but we can clearly see the slit-like mouth. So that is a true sea anemone, order actiniaria. Thank you, pilot. I'm saying that's a lot larger, but you can still see that it's maybe only, what, four centimeters across. Right. It's still so, pretty small. So this would be the same species, that tiny one we saw just a few minutes ago, I think? There's, um, that's, 
I'm saying that, but there's no way to determine that without actually collecting Glad and looking at internal anatomy. They're fairly complicated to uh, identify, and there's only a few specialists that I know who have the tools and the knowledge to uh, get those to species. You were saying it's really the folds in their st stomach that are diagnostic? For it's it's the, the histology, yeah. which is a word that uh, describes uh, basically microscopic anatomy of cellular tissue, and so it's the... Um, structure of the oh. tissue that makes up those walls, okay. right? Exactly. What's how are the muscles arranged there? Um, also, the stinging cells. Uh, there's a variety of types of stinging cell, and so there's a whole categorization. There's probably more than 30 different types, and so the complement of stinging cells that it has is also useful uh, for taxonomy. And again, those are subcellular structures, so you would need, you know, a scanning electron microscope oh, really? yeah. or a transmission electron microscope in order to get a really good um, analysis. And so what would happen is you'd take a piece of tissue and you'd thin section it and put those sections on a microscope, stain them, and study them that way. Okay. Is there something on the top of the rock, um, just above the lasers pilot, on the top of the rock, uh, halfway between the lasers and the top of the screen, it's a Slightly different color. Uh, no, it's almost directly right of the laser now. It's just a high point of that rock. It looks right fuzzy. Yeah. It's definitely a different texture. Yeah, I don't know. I don't hmm. know if there's encrusting sponge there or it's just sediment and microbial working, but it looks to me like it's got some relief above the rock. Yeah, I, I agree. It looks huh. like it's got a lot of little grains in it. Yeah, yep. it looks uh, like a flat tube. <laughs> so we'll just chalk that up to it's something. Something. <laughs> There's another so. sea cucumber. I think that was the one we imaged before. That pink one uh, may have been the Cycropodes, maybe. What do yep. we have here? Oh, here we have one of our uh, hooded tunicates, the oh, predatory right. tunicates. So this is a uricordate. It's also got a polychaete. This is also something that I remember, I think, uh, Diva, on your leg in the Marianas, we, see, we saw a lot of these um, octonemids, I believe they're called, it's the family octonemidae, uh, these tunicates that had an associate polychaete. Now, this is a sea squirt in shallow water. There are lots of sea squirts. Maybe you're familiar with them. You poke them, and they uh, close up, and they squirt a little bit of water, water jet at you. But this is a different kind. Those ones are suspension feeders. Oh, yeah, that little spherule. Yeah. Yeah, we were seeing that in oh. those, uh, when we were looking at uh, those big piles of the globules. Yeah, there were some of those there in there. Some of those as okay. well, yeah. Uh, but just to finish on that uh, tunicate, so most of them are sus um Suspension feeders, filter feeders is the word I'm looking for, and they draw in a current and filter out particles, but these have adapted to become predatory, and so the in-current flow, instead of just kind of moving into a tube or a siphon, that has been modified into a big hood, and that hood yeah. can close over swimming plankton, and then uh, they would digest that. So kind of like a Venus flytrap. Cool. They're uricordates, so they're invertebrates that are very, very closely related to uh, chordates, vertebrates. Yeah, I see the trace. I don't see the chitin nope. in that particular rock. It's much brighter over there, so maybe it's moved on to a rock <laughs> further to the right. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's very impressive. It goes on and on. So... So yeah, so if you're just joining us today, this is the Okeanos Explorer, and we're about 60 miles north of the equator. We're diving on the very uh, far western end of the Clipperton Transform. And this would be a long scar we could trace all the way back across the Pacific to the east to the modern East Pacific Rise Spreading Center. We're coming up on a bit of steep topography here, which is um, probably a zone where that uh, transformer's been pulled apart or a block has been pushed up as plate motions uh, were changing through time. And we often think of these areas as tectonic windows, so we're probably looking at some cross-section of the, of the ocean crust here, although what we're seeing right on the surface is, is this heavy manganese crust that would have built up over the past 120 plus million years. So it looks like a little bit more of an exposed face here. I don't know if that's anything different, but... Yeah, we can certainly see if we can take a look here, yes.
Yeah, where it's broken, yeah, let's see if, if there's any way to get a rock. Yeah, you can see this whole ledge kind of working around here for a little bit on the right side. Yeah, let's uh, give it a shot if we can. Yeah, it's gonna be gonna be rough here, I think, but we'll, g we'll give it a try. These rocks are smaller than I thought. Nope. <laughs> I think we bounced backwards. <laughs> That's what I saw. <laughs> so it looks like a, a little benign boulder there on the surface is actually. Pretty pretty heavily crusted in right yep. here, and again, the the more time these these rocks uh, sit here, uh, the thicker those crusts get. And as we move north here, we're getting into what's sometimes known as the prime crust region. And and the reason that's so valuable is that it is a piece of old seafloor um, where these crusts have really got thick accumulations. Okay. Oh yeah, nice kind of breaking slope here. Can't tell if that here is a sponge or if that's sediment. <laughs> yeah, you can see in cereals this looks like a channel, doesn't it? Or a right. shoot or something. It really, really does, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Before we go too far, um, Dan, after this, uh, there's something unusual on the left side that was on the the edge of this uh, chute. It was on the rocks. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Oh. Huh. Oh, it's another sea cucumber. I see. Okay, it's just it's a different morph. It's a different color. It looks a little bit like the uh, synactylid, synalactidae that we saw earlier. That was I forget what color that was. Maybe pinkish. Um, this is different than that. Okay, thanks. Let's go back to the uh, overview. Yeah, so if you look over in camera two on, on Cirrus, you can get a, a nice view of what the slope looks like. We do have these areas of exposed rock, then other areas where it looks like sediment is coming down in channels. I'm always amazed at the ability of sediment or uh, similar to what we see on land with fluvial systems. These things sort of organize into these these channels and different scales and we see that also in the submarine environment and we'll, we'll continue to see that some of the great examples of this we move north in this expedition. There's some really beautiful channels, um, kind of the basin scale as we move up into Palmyra. Here it looks like small areas on this, this slope where um, sediment seems to be moving down from, from up above, which may have to do with the topography at the top of the ridge and, and ocean currents. Um, really f fabulous view here. So yeah, as I were, we were saying earlier, um, we're really on old, old seafloor here, um, 120 million years or older. Really, the first part of the um, we think of the modern Pacific Basin to open up, and it, the tectonics of this area are really interesting. And they're poorly understood. And one reason for that is that um, one of the main re ways that marine geologists study uh, the age of the seafloor and seafloor spreading process in general is with these magnetic anomalies. And over the last 20 million years or so, we see that the Earth's magnetic poles basically flip. The North Pole becomes the South Pole, or vice versa. About every Oh, 200,000 to 300,000 years. Um, the most, the last time it happened was actually quite a bit longer than that now, about 780,000 years ago. But 
Um, we see these fairly frequent reversals in modern times, but there have been times in the geologic past when the magnetic field has been stable for a really long time. And so when this piece of seafloor was forming here, this was probably in or, or very near the what we call the Cretaceous normal period. And it would have been a, a time when the magnetic field didn't reverse between about 121 and 83 million years ago. And so um, when that's going on, when that's going on, then we're not, uh, we don't have the opportunity to actually estimate the age of the, of the seafloor or get estimates of spreading rates at those times. And so that's one of the reasons this part of the uh, Pacific Basin are really so poorly understood as far as tectonics. I can hear you, pilot. Thank you, Nav, and welcome, Fernando. Uh, yes, can you hear me, pilot? Okay, I said uh, welcome to the chair, Fernando. Well, it sure looks like a rubble pile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like trying to lure you in, right? As soon as you try to pick one up, though, you'll think differently. Yeah. It's amazing. So, Astrid's... I think there's... Oh! There's a super fish on the right. So Astrid thinks she sees a fish. I definitely see a bamboo <laughs> coral. And this is a really interesting morphology. Oh, there's the fish. Okay. Stand by, Astrid. We see the fish. Uh, yes, we would like to see the fish, please, pilot. And camera two, I have to tell everyone, is a really interesting view. You'll note that that uh, coral is right on the nose right. of that feature, <laughs> which would be where you would have the most accelerated current, I believe. So this looks like another, uh, could be another Leucochorus, which is the genus that we saw early in the dive of the specimen that had the damaged head. I could uh, yeah. be wrong. Can't get, I don't know. Astrid, what do you think? Are the, are the eyes large enough? response here, Bruce, that it was a but yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it's got kind of an unusual uh, bicolored appearance. So some of the Leucochorus have these pale white bodies, some of them have dark blotches all over the bodies and in between. I haven't seen one with this uh, distinct dark head and light uh, body. I wish we could get a better view of the head to see if it's got this large uh, eye. The eye lacks a lens in Luca Chorus, so it's uh, quite unusual, this sort of glassy stare uh, on, on the eye of the fish. But that's my best guess is Luca Chorus. It looked like there was another little fish or a Keating gnat beside it, too. Yeah, I saw that, Bruce. I'm not sure. I don't think it's a Keating gnat. I don't think it's moving the right way. It's pretty small and it's pretty far out there. Noted, noted that a bicolored. Uh,
Yeah, well, and that can be quite complicated. Uh, Ken Sulak, who's not on the uh, chat room right now, unfortunately, but uh, has done a lot of work in uh, the Atlantic and has also looked at a lot of specimens from the uh, New Caledonia area, has commented uh, during our dives in the past that there are different uh, colors of those fishes, lighter or darker, in the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean, um, and he was trying to figure out what those might mean, what the patterns are, but uh, couldn't quite work that out. So there's a very interesting topic there with the different uh, uh, color morphs of a lot of different deep-sea species between ocean basins and different sections of the ocean basins. Huh. So it looks like possibly, quite likely, a couple of bamboo corals here. And uh, this is really, really deep for bamboo corals. Um, I do know of some that exist at uh, this depth, uh, much, much smaller than what we're looking at here in the genus Bathygorgia. And if this is not Bathygorgia, then that would instantly make this collection worthy. Yeah, you get a get a great view from Sirius to see sort of where the ROV is in relation to this little little knob that the coral is sitting on. Um, see, the pilot's gonna um, try to get up and kind of set down on the edge of it to give us a better look. I have to uh, check here in the chat room. Um, unfortunately, Abby Lapointe is not in the chat room. Les Watling is, but the two of them wrote a paper uh, describing a new species of Bathygorgia, uh, which, as I just said, is, uh, as far as I know, the deepest known bamboo coral. And this was from the uh, abyssal zone of the uh, Pacific, but further to the east, and also some from uh, Tasmania. What was their depth? Can we, can we yeah, break the record here? Checking. So the genus Bathygorgia, unique species collected below 3,000 meters. Uh, suitably vague. <laughs> Only right there. <laughs> the deepest specimen was collected at 4,700 meters. Oh, so we're a little bit a little shy bit, yeah. of that. We're close, though. 45. All right. Uh -huh. Beautiful. Interesting kink in the skeleton there. And I do see, I'm looking almost in the center of the screen, and there's a polyp on the back side. I can see some uh, oblique rows of rod-shaped sclerites, but I don't see anything prominent between the tentacles. Let me quickly get to the figures here. Yeah, and I see that the Bathygorgia also has these rod-like sclerites. So I would say... Uh, Pilot, do you feel that you're in a comfortable location that you could make a collection? So what we would then uh, ask for is just a snip from the top of this. Yep, standing by. Uh, stand by video. Uh, let me just finish a note to shore here.
Uh, we really only need, let's say, uh, five, six inches from the top. And this should be one that uh, would be easily clipped, uh, cut. And in fact, I would expect that this depth that the carbonate skeleton might actually be a little bit soft. Hmm. Go ahead now. Uh, no, there will be no confusion between the two. Thanks for asking. Just don't let those little balls fly out. Yeah, well, there's <laughs> that, sure. So, uh, Dell, this would be two, right? This would be two. two. Yep, spec two bio. Thank you. All right, so uh, we're getting pilots are getting ready to make this collection of this uh, bamboo coral, and I was suggesting that perhaps it's in the genus. Uh, Bathygorgia, that is the deepest known of the bamboo corals. So, so Scott, what is it? Sorry. Pilot, you weren't trying to reach me, were you? Well, I would expect that given the density of organisms we see, we'll probably make a few biological collections today. So if you want to be play it safe, let's go to starboard. Great. Sorry, Del. Yeah, I was say saying, what, what, uh, what did we see there that led you to think this is a different species than what uh, Les had reported before? Or is it, you think this is potentially the same? Right, so I wasn't sure uh, what species this might be based on the characters I was seeing. And fortunately, Les Watling did um, get into the chat room and has made some observations here and he said that the density of pinules on the tentacles appeared higher than usual so uh, first we don't know for certain that it's bathygorgia mm -hmm. but I'm saying that because it looked like it had rods it didn't have the prominent needles the depth that we're at and the fact that it's this unbranched stock all of that is consistent at least with the genus bathygorgia um, but uh, he's much more familiar, having uh, he and his student, Abby LaPointe, who have uh, done the most recent descriptions, the only descriptions in the last 150 years of this uh, <laughs> genus. In fact, the genus had been more or less uh, abandoned um, until the paper in 2015 by uh, Abby LaPointe and Les Watling resurrecting the genus for some specimens that had been found in Tasmania. That looks really good, pilot. Sorry, pilot. That looks good. Thank you. Beautiful. All right. So what we know from what we have seen of other corals have had experienced damage. And some of the times, you know, Dell, we've been talking on this leg about uh, what looks like aberrant branching. I've said when there's been an injury or there's been predation and the tissue has been removed, you can see that the colony continues to grow in a different direction. And so one of the nice things about sampling with an ROV is we can take just a piece of the colony and we leave part of it behind and it will continue to grow, much like trimming your trees, for example. Um, and that's much different from if you were sampling with a trawl or a dredge, which is kind of indiscriminate sampling and may uh, be quite destructive. Right. And we also have this information now 
of exactly how this colony was growing in situ. You know, we know its relative position and so on. We would know if other organisms were associated with it, which it doesn't look like in this particular case. Yeah, I got caught there. <laughs> I bet you couldn't do that if you tried. All right. Yeah. All right, so that was successfully collected and deposited into the starboard outboard, outboard bio box. Thank you, pilot. So Les Watling is sharing with us sharing with us on shore that this would be the second deepest ever collection of a bamboo coral. I'll take it. 4700 meters. Yep, we just missed it by less than 200 meters. And once you are all stowed and ready to go uh, Fernando had shown that there's another colony just at the toe of this. It's probably the same thing, but let's just be certain as we go by, please. Oh, thank you for reminding me, Roland. Yeah, if we could zoom in again on this colony uh, at the base. Oh, okay. I thought you meant right at the base of the colony here. Okay. Welcome back. Thanks for spotting these. So the first thing we want to look, just turn to the right, and we believe there may be a sea star or feather star. Copy that. Video is the one who saw it. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So it's just come into screen on the left. It's kind of a yellowish brown pilot. And it's right below the lasers now. And it looks to me like it's a crinoid. I think it's another five, oh, this is not another because last time, I was going to say another five arm crinoid, but the last one we looked at was a brisingid. Okay. This may be our first crinoid today. Uh, so I was about to, about to say, yeah, I think, I think this is our first one of the day. So abundant on some of the previous dives that we've been on. Doesn't really look any smaller than uh, the other ones. No, it doesn't. So indeed, we are looking at a crinoid, another member of the Echinodermata. These are commonly called feather stars, more formally called comatulid crinoids. And you can see that it has these uh, short leg-like structures called cirri that it uses to grip the rock. And then it has these uh, long arms with the side branches. And you can see they're kind of fuzzy. Those are tube feet that are in there, which is a good indication that it's related to the sea stars and the brittle stars and so on. And in this case, the mouth is oriented upwards away from the bottom. And this is capturing drifting food particles out of the water column. Thank you, pilot. That's good. Yeah, pilot, um, just as you're pushing out, if you are going to the left, is that the direction you're headed to port? Um, you were looking at something before we went up onto the top of this slope. There's a little colony at the bottom of this uh, feature. 
Yeah, so off the feature, before we came up on it, you were looking at something on the bottom. Yeah. They should be just coming into view now. They're quite small. So it'll be in the distance. Yeah, it'll be off the feature going ahead. Yep. Just, I think, yeah, the, yep. Yep, there we go. Yeah, it, it, so it may be the same as what we just sampled, and if that's the case, we don't have to settle down and spend time. The question is, is this one branched? No, I don't think it is. I think I was looking at a sediment channel behind it. Yeah, so that looks like the same thing that we just sampled. Thank you, pilot. So it's the second uh, colony in the same area. It's interesting. We just saw the one. Oh, and there's a sea cucumber just to its left of the lasers. You can see the coiled uh, golden-colored uh, intestine. That's basically the sediment that's being held in the intestine, and you can kind of see some of those podia waving above it. Thank you, pilot. We can move on up slope. like maybe a, another holothurian sea cucumber here in the just above left of the lasers. Two hours, 25 minutes, copy. All right. So far, Dell, what's interesting to me is that the geology is unexpected to what I thought I would see, but the biology is pretty much exactly what I thought I would see. Yeah, I think you kind of nailed it when your description earlier. Uh, small, smaller things, uh, maybe a little, little less, little different organisms, of course. Um, maybe a little less diversity. We haven't seen a sponge today, have we? We have not seen a sponge that we could absolutely say okay. was a sponge. We saw yeah. that one sort of encrusting thing. We yeah. didn't know what it was. So a larger anemone here. Pilot, um, as you're going forward, it's going to be to the left of the lasers. There's something white on the rock. Thank you. And I'm seeing there's a couple more of the oh, yeah. uh, bamboo colonies coming up ahead. Yes, that is the one. Thank you. So it's another sea anemone. This one looks even larger now than the ones we've seen before. And I'm not sure that this is different. The ones that we were looking at before I thought were a little bit more transparent than this, but otherwise very, very similar. It's so hard to tell with the anemones. Les Watling is saying this abyssal, quotes, plain is quite lumpy. <laughs> well, Les, that's why we chose to go up the slope. Uh, that's but, right. But uh, I will agree it's a lot more lumpy than I would have expected to see down here at this depth. Yeah, this is such a, a large feature, really, that it you know must have an effect on bottom currents. So you sure. can imagine that this is kind of a localized area where you might get outcrop down in the abyssal region. So there we go. Uh, this is another... Actinearian, a true sea anemone. And you can just see a little bit of the body column and where it attaches to the rock there. So that's, we'd have to, you know, go back to our earlier imagery and see if this might be the same or different. But what would be interesting is that we've now seen a range of sizes from very, very small intermediate to now a fairly large one. Thank you, pilot. That's good. One video is happy.
Uh, we can go buy the uh, the whips. With, that's the same thing that we just collected, but it's a good idea for us just to see them as we're passing to uh, make a note of them. It's on the left. It'll, as you turn to the left, you'll see it'll come up ahead of you. There you go. I actually see a couple of There's another one further to the left. There's also a sea cucumber there. It's just approaching the right side of the screen where the skid is. So I think again, this is the one called Cycropodes. Um, yeah, there's something behind the sea cucumber on the edge of the rock that is actually more interesting than the sea cucumber because we saw that already, so it's just above the laser. The question now is, is this a sponge or is this a coral? My guess is that's a predatory sponge, a carnivorous ah. sponge. Yep, that's definitely what it is. So cool. I wonder if uh, Shirley got back with us. This is something uh, she was really eager uh, to hope to see. And you can see it's really interesting because it has the kind of shape. You might have expected that to be a coral from a distance. When you said it was more interesting, I was going to assume it was a coral. Right, so. <laughs> right. And I think this is just experience yeah. seeing these sorts of things. Right. But um, now I'm hesitating because it looks like coral again. <laughs> yeah. It's the bright white things made me think that that was a sponge that had actually captured some prey and the tissue had moved over and that's what was bright white huh. but on that last focus you can see there was clearly something waving from it huh uh this surely oh. still in the chat room or she's still logged in at least oh she is oh, yeah great. oh she oh she now. just came in she must be listening and well surely i hope i didn't get you all excited for nothing <laughs> Either way, this is going to be very interesting. Agreed. Yeah, it's that uh, it's that really small size that also made me think sponge as opposed to coral. Okay. All right. Oh, it's neither of those things. <laughs> this is a bryozoan. How cool. This is the best looking bryozoan that I've ever seen. We're always guessing things are bryozoan based on its structure, but here you can see these are kind of U-shaped arms. Yeah. Uh, they're actually uh, replete with cilia, so they're generating a current. Um, I'm trying to remember if bryozoans have a common name. Moss animals, I think, is the easiest common name. They're very, very common in shallow water. Uh, but they're also suspension feeders, and you can see all their little tentaculate structures stuck out. Wow. I don't think the folks on shore have a good view like I have. And some of them don't have the audio on. They're guessing it was a, a sponge also. Diva thought the corals here are really teensy, but uh, those sure look like lophophores to me. Asako Matsumoto from Japan agrees that uh, that's a bryozoan. And now Les Watling, once he gets the good view, agrees that it's a bryozoan. And Diva, I see that you said that you have collected some in the uh, eastern uh, clarion clipperton fracture zone. I think that's what the CCZ is. Is that correct? Yeah, so yeah. the clipperton clarion fracture zone. Clarion. So the clarion is the next fracture zone to the north. Oh, got it. So it's sort of a geographic region uh, here in the central Pacific people will refer to. Um, so Diva, uh, were you agreeing then that it is a bryozoan? 
Yes, most certainly. And you can see in the ones we've collected the same sort of morph morphological features, which is that kind of that very sort of Y shape almost. Yep. Um, and so it's just it's really interesting to see one alive and in situ because all the ones that we've gotten have been either in um, box cores when they've kind of been you know sloshed around a bit. So this is just brilliant. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, as I say, we've seen a lot of these, um, what we're calling bryzoans, not necessarily to have that shape, but we don't see those feeding tentacles extended, and that's what's so nice, and it makes it so clear that that's what we're looking at. So um, that's good for us, pilot. We've got an identification. Uh, we're quite happy. A lot of people on shore are really pleased because um, we rarely see them feeding. Mm. Uh, Tim Shank agrees, a great image of a bryzoan, looks healthy. Les Watling says that's fantastic. And Diva Moan, who you just heard from on the phone, had said that uh, we've never actually seen one alive in situ, but they had collected some um, in the abyssal zone just to our east. Good stuff. So it's interesting, it's another suspension feeder. It's really mm -hmm. small. We haven't seen any bryzoans that I could tell you we've seen so far on this leg of the expedition, I mean. Uh, no pilot, I don't see anything right now. I see something bright white in the far right distance, but uh, I don't see anything local here. Kind of looks like it has legs or something. <laughs> Doesn't look like it has something extended from uh, it. Yeah. What do we got going on here? Yeah. Something on the end of a stub. Is that a crinoid? Crinoid with something white in the center. Or is that a crinoid on a sponge? I'm going to stop guessing and just wait. Mm -hmm. it is oh, surely. You're going to love this. I think we might want to be uh, staying here for a minute. Well, Shirley may have fainted on the way to the <laughs> phone. Um, I, I, that's a sponge. I can tell you that much. Yeah, really. Can you, can you hear me okay now? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you now, Shirley. Okay, good. Yeah. Boy, I got back just in time. I heard there haven't been any sponges at all, and I said I wanted a monster carnivorous sponge, and it looks like I got one. I think you did, and it looks like there's a polychaete tube on the stock. So um, is this a glass sponge, or is this a demo sponge? This is a demo sponge. If it's uh, what I'm thinking it is, it looks like one of the cloud arises. Uh, we'll take a closer look at it, but if it's what I'm thinking it is, it's a clatterized sponge, which is a demo sponge. That's a good point, Shirley. I should have known that. Very interesting. So the the clatterizids is a a group, a family of sponges that have sort of given up the typical sponge habit of feeding where they draw in a water current and instead have taken to capturing prey. Look at that. There's a sea anemone growing on the, underneath huh. it. Um, I'm going to suggest that this might be interesting for a collection. Um, Shirley, is this something that you recognize or is this something that might be a valuable uh, collection? It's not any, yeah, you know what, it's not anything, um, I mean, it's, it's very similar to other clatter rises that have been described, but there are many. I'd say something like this is the starburst. It could be one of three different genera, so I'm not sure what it is. The fact that there's that anemone on it makes it even more interesting, and it's, uh, wow, it's really interesting. I see there's uh, various Have amphipods on the spine. Yet? We've made uh, one collection of a bamboo coral a short time ago. And we collected some of the spherules um, using the uh, shovel. Uh, Miss Chris Kelly on the line. Well, I'll leave it up to the group to decide. Yeah, okay. I'll leave it up to the group to decide. Um, but this is pretty interesting.
Yeah, so what Scott mentioned, the, these engines um, have become adapted to yep. living in areas Pilot, where just there aren't that many um, we're just trying to just particles to filter out. And so they've adapted by uh, becoming carnivorous. So instead of having that, uh, what are called choanocyte chambers, these little cells with flagella that create a water current through the sponge, and the sponge filters out bacteria and small uh, you know, microplankton out of water, um, these sponges uh, feed in a different way. They trap food particles on the surface. It is trapped in delicious spicules that are on the, the surface of the sponge. And then the sponge uh, has cells that completely engulf the prey and, uh, and digest it. So really, really interesting. Go ahead. Uh, Pilot, I do believe that there's enough interest to collect this if we believe you're in the position to do so. Pilots, watch lead. This would be better in starboard because of the sticky nature of the sponge. It could, uh, the stuff that was making up those spherules could stick to the sponge. Pilot, if you could clip it just below the tube that's uh, sticking off. And this should cut very easily.
So just to highlight how important expeditions like these are, we had done some AUV transects in the eastern CCZ, and because the vehicle is flying at, you know, 5 to 10 meters off the seafloor, and it doesn't have the luxury of stopping and doing close-ups on animals like this, we had images of an, of an animal, which I'm pretty sure is this now, and we had thought it was a type of hydrozoan, like a branchioceriamphus or something. And now, thanks to this uh, amazing imagery and this amazing collection, we're going to be able to see what it is. And now we think it's sponge. So, I mean, that's a completely different phylum to what we had been seeing earlier. Thanks, Diva. That's a great comment. Really well said. And uh, it's definitely, I think we all feel the value of this uh, Okeanos Explorer program. It gives us the freedom to really explore and look at these animals in detail in their environment. Nice touch, pilot. All right, so if you're just tuning in today, you're watching a live video from the Okeanos Explorer. Uh, we're diving today about 60 miles north of the equator at 162 degrees west longitude. We're at yeah, uh, yeah, no, the, so that was the anemone that we were imaging earlier is collapsed. And we just passed over. I'm not sure if that was a sponge or not. But I think, um, Geology, you better direct a bit if we want to make our way up the slope. Yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> We've got about two hours and five minutes of bottom time left. That collection was made at about 4,112 or 13 or 14 meters. 45, 14, let's call it that. 1.3 degrees Celsius. And a very exciting collection of uh, carnivorous sponge, demo sponge. Um, Shirley was referring to it as a starburst sponge, only a few know. All right. R ramming speed. I don't know who's fooling who. <laughs> Well, well, we'll get the uh, rock hammer and drill on the next edition of the D2 here, yep. I guess. There's another one of the bamboo corals there just off to the right. So those are not uncommon. And I see that one also has no associates. And uh, Les Watling had said earlier that the Bathy Gorgia don't seem to have associates on them. And I'm not sure if that's, I mean, we saw a crinoid, so we know there are things that could yeah. land on them. So that might suggest that there's some uh, chemi chemical inhibitor, some biochemical, something about the biochemistry of the tissue that might deter things from settling on it. 
Well, so, just a cer certainly gets you up in the water column, but not a lot of three-dimensional structure, really, to, to wrap around. Depends what you need. Yeah. Yep. Copy that, Nev. Uh, copy that, pilot. I don't see it. Your eyes are better than mine. Feel free to zoom. Right. Oh, yeah. Good. Ca yep. Good call. Uh, yep. The uh, octanemid. No, sorry. I pushed the wrong button now. Yeah, so this is a tunicate that has been modified to become predatory. And so what you're looking at is a top-down view of this very large hood that in the filter feeding type would just be a siphon, but has been modified to hood that can kind of reach over and close like a big mouth over its prey. There's a black coral that you're going to pass over. The lasers are just to the upper left. It is to the lower left of the lasers. It's coming off the front of a rock. And we've seen it before, but we're just wondering every once in a while, have a look to see if there's associates in the branches. But we don't need to uh, spend too much time. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything in it. Yep, that's the one. Sorry about that. You can see there's a pretty good current. Yeah. So it's a really nice view. Indeed, that is a black coral. Uh, you can see the black skeleton through the transparent tissue, and this one has pretty large polyps, actually. I mean, it's an overall small colony, but to me, those polyps, the tentacles look much, much bigger and inflated compared to the ones that we've been oh, seeing in yeah, shallow water. I, I certainly think so, yeah. Yeah, and I don't know, you know, if that's the better to catch it. And it looks like, you know, I might have guessed that those were eggs, the white stuff inside, but they look more to me like what I'm seeing in the sediments. So maybe that's something that it's caught coming down in the water column. Huh. Some forams could be, uh, I mean, that's where the digestive system is. So perhaps right. that's evidence of some stuff that it's fed on. Thank you, pilot. Yep. Uh, exactly. So... No, you're not way off at all. So the tissue color of a black coral comes in all kinds of colors. And when we're in shallower water, we're very often seeing pinks and purples. Um, but here in the deep water, they're more often transparent to slightly white in color. There's even a, I think there's even a greenish morph. So it looks like there's a stick or a pen right there just to the right of the lasers. I wonder if that's a polychaete or fish. Oh, it's going to be an Ipnops. It's another one of the Ipnops fish that we saw earlier. This is the first fish we've seen in a while. And as Astrid has been saying... And it's right on sediment again. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> that's what I was just going to say, Astrid. See, there's a lot of little clear mounds here, and that you know could be burrowing uh, crustaceans or worms. It doesn't necessarily have to be. You know, earlier we were talking about the burrowing urchins right. that left long trails, uh, but there are a variety of other things that burrow down into the sediment. Yeah, you get a good look at those highly modified eyes. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, Bruce was describing as plaques. Very strange. Yeah, so the eyes lack most of the structure that we uh, think of when we think of eyes and uh, are basically just uh, photoreceptors, just for sensing dim light from the bioluminescence that other organisms produce. So it's interesting that it's so uh, unperturbed by the presence of the ROV. I have no idea of what uh, this animal senses when you get the bright lights, the uh, really intense floodlights of the ROV. Uh, probably don't want to linger on it too long because uh, we don't know what that light does to the eyes of these fishes. It's, it's a, a little sit and wait predator. That's an interesting observation, Bruce, the fact that it's got the, such large plates for capturing whatever light and it doesn't seem to be reacting to all the light that we are uh, inputting here. So 
I can't really tell, Dell, if our slope has changed at all. You know, we had all that exposed rock, and now we have sediment again. <laughs> yeah, from the scale of what we can see from our maps, which are made with the shipboard multi-beam system, it doesn't look like the slope would have changed. Um, but again, those are very big footprints, uh, averaged over about 70 meters by 70 meters in area. And then, uh, we're, you know, these are much smaller scales we're looking at here. So maybe there's a slight change in slope. Where are all the sea pens? <laughs> I was sure we would see an Umbalula today, which is a really beautiful sea pen. A lot of people really enjoy seeing them. There's another Ipnops that we're passing over. This fish with the modified eyes. And I, I see now they're really easy to identify from a distance. Oh, that one's oh, moving. He's gonna there move, we go. Yeah. So that one seemed to detect the ROV and not want to have anything to do with it. The tiniest piece of rock sticking out there. Yep. All right. It's a bigger piece. These are just ledges, you know. I'm seeing there's some white edges, but I think they're just yeah. ledge pieces or something. Huh. Well, and then we're back into this a bit steeper, a bit more rocky. Yeah, so if you look at Sirius there, you can see the transition from that uh, sediment area up onto this more rocky area. Maybe we're just down on one of these little channels yeah. um, that we've been seeing. Sure. There's something brown tucked down. I think it's just the face of a rock maybe, but it's tucked down on that little chute on the left side of the laser. On the left, and it might be something different. I think it's a sea cucumber. Oh, I think that's just a cucumber. It's not just a sea cucumber. <laughs> on, uh, on I the got really excited. I thought we might have another family. I was I was really hoping we'd see uh, some eel pals. So ours did. Got it. And they kind of are elongate and rest on the bottom like that. So sorry to all the cucumber and invert folks. Didn't mean to uh, offend. <laughs> Any comments on the rock here? Yeah, it looks like this is actually broken. We're not seeing that crust we're kind of seeing inside. Looks looks pretty old and, and altered. Um, but yeah, we definitely see that, that uh, thick crust is being exposed here, the inside of what the rock looks like. And so these rocks, as they, they sit here, um, through time, seawater diffuses in. Yeah, so there's a couple of things on the rock. I noticed a couple of worm tubes, and then there's a little disc there. I'm not sure if that was a limpet. Or something else. Oh, this is actually a worm. I thought it was a sea cucumber, but this is a scale worm. Yeah. Oh, and there is a fish. There's a fish. Oh, that's the Ipnops. It's the that's okay. That's the one we were just imaging. Yep. So this um, we've seen many of these scale worm polychaetes, polynoid polychaetes in the family Polynoidae. I think that's what this is, but. Uh, this is certainly a different one. It looks a little bit larger than what we've been seeing. It's staying nice and still <laughs> for us to be able to view it. But remember, so polychaete worms, these are uh, members of the annelid worms, which include the earthworms. And, you know, earthworms are relatively smooth. Um, they belong to the oligochaeta. That means naked uh, CD. Okay. Um, the polychaete have many CD, and that's these uh, side bristles that come out of each side of each segment. You can clearly see them shining kind of gold and white there. Yep, that's a big one. Um, those are the bristles, or they're also called chaetae. So polychaete means many chaetae. And then each of these paddle-like appendages that the chaetae are sticking out of um, have structures in this case, in this particular family, that are modified into these flat plates. They're called the elytra and they're lining the dorsal surface of this worm or the back of this worm. And they create a little bit of space between the plate and the upper part of the body that allows water to be channeled in and out. So if this was in a tight space, it could still get uh, water and oxygen hmm. to the gills. 
You can see the head end is at the right side, and there's some sensory tentacles that are arising from the head end. Not sure why, maybe just resting here on the bottom. I mean, they are benthic, they spend much of their time pushing around the bottom, but they're capable of swimming up in the water column. So that's cool. Awesome polychaete I'm hearing. I just realized that uh, I may have said that's just another Ipnops, and I didn't mean it that way, Astrid. I was not trying to get revenge on the <laughs> just an invertebrate. There's a fish in the center of the screen. This may be the one we've seen a couple of times now that has the different colored head from the rest of the body. It's another one of the Leucochora species, this Cuskiel uh, with the very large eye that has the uh, lens reduced to almost nothing. Uh, this one has the same bicolored pattern with the head and the body, but it has the dark gray spots on the body. Now that I see this one, I am reminded that we have seen others have the bicolor uh, between the head and the body. Uh, so it seems like there are several of these Cuskiel ge uh, genera that have that sort of color pattern. We have no idea if that means anything or not. So, a Leucochorus species. Thank you, Bruce. So we have a good idea on the fish. We can move on. Well, we've passed the 4,500 meter mark, Del. Yeah, we're com coming up here. We're at uh, 4,497 meters depth, approximately. Right now, we're a little bit higher off the bottom as we scan around and get a sense of the slope that's coming ahead. So we're about four meters off bottom. Yes, yeah, so this is our, our deepest dive so far, and this will be the deepest dive of our, our expedition here. Um, we're in the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument in the Jarvis region, and uh, we'll be transiting tomorrow, but then heading up for a series of dives up in Kingman and Palmyra. Yeah, we've had an exciting set of dives here in the, um, the Jarvis unit of this monument, and just some fantastic biology uh, mapped some uh, unknown, previously unknown features. And now we're getting this rare opportunity to get an ROV at some of the deepest parts of the ocean. Of course, this is only about half the deepest depth of the ocean. That's right. <laughs> down in the trenches. But in terms of uh, overall area, this is sort of a much more typical. The average depth of the ocean is on the order of 3,800 meters. Um, looks like a swimming sea cucumber ahead. Yes, indeed. You can see that this is a sea cucumber that is lifted off the bottom and is uh, flapping its body so that it can move to a new location. That uh, yellow coil you're seeing is sediments that have been packed into its intestine. So you can see right through the wow. body and you're seeing the gut. <laughs> um, indication again that this is moving around, ingesting sediments and digesting whatever organics it can get out of the sediments. <laughs> the upper part there is the head end and that red ring would be the mouth. And you can see these modified tube feet that are kind of like little arms that it uses to grab fistfuls of sediment, if you will, and it sort of sticks them into its mouth and spends some time digesting. So this will eventually stop its flapping and just settle back down to the, uh, the bottom, and if there's appropriate organics there, start feeding. Keep eating and deposit. Well, Les Watling uh, adds a very interesting observation here about the bamboo coral that we collected earlier. And he says that um, 
they have several bamboo specimens from the nodule area to the east of this site. By nodule area, he means that there's a great expanse of the abyssal plain that has manganese nodules on it. These, I think of them as little charcoal briquettes made of manganese. Yeah, they're kind of a close cousin of the crust we get along the seamounts. So we get, a, get the crust here in the seamounts because we have less sediment. But out, out in the deep ocean, often we'll get these little nodules that'll nucleate and, and form. So he notes that uh, all the bamboo corals that they collected there are less than 10 centimeters in size, and one is maybe three centimeters if you stretch it out. So huh. the one we saw was considerably larger than that. It's probably, what, maybe 70 centimeters tall, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Not quite a meter, but good size. Looks like a sea cucumber down here in the center of the screen. There we go. So we just saw a swimming sea cucumber. Here's a different species. Um, Diva, if you're still in the line, not sure if this is another Cycropodes. So I think the swimming one was um, either a Peniagony or an Amparima again. Um, and this one is definitely from the family Sinalactidae. It looks like a cross between an Orthonergus and... Uh, and a Nerophanta. A Nerophanta usually have a, a bit thicker papillae, but definitely the family, oh no, not the family from Lactidae, Diamatidae, sorry. So if, I, if I had to guess, I'd say a Nerophanta, I guess. I'll enter that into the chat. Here's another one, Diva. Um, you might be just a little bit delayed, but this one's uh, pinker in color. Right. So this one looks, this one is a Nerophanta for sure. This is exactly what a Nerophanta usually looks like from the family Diamatidae. And so the other one is something else from the family, not a Nerophanta and not Orphanergus and not one I'm familiar with or have seen before, which is really interesting. Um, but this one is definitely a Nerophanta. Uh, no, I, th I think it was okay. She, um, I just think she wasn't sure what genus it is, but we got a good look at it. Thank you. Oh, well, if you've got the time, sure, we can get a little bit longer look. I don't think that was the issue. Again, you can see they're pretty lightweight. But what's instructive about looking at this sea cucumber is that it is not flapping its body, and it right. does not have a sail on it. So this is not one that would normally swim from place to place. Yeah, so we're just passing about 4,486 meters here. And uh, it's, I was talking about um, this being deep, uh, part of the, the abyssal seafloor here. When you think uh, deep in geology, you think about the seafloor, you should also think old. Of course, the seafloor um, cools and the lithosphere thickens and it subsides with time. And it kind of falls off as the the square root of age. The the depth increases as sort of the square root of age. And so if you're a, 
a geology MEA 470 student that should be studying for their final in a couple days, and you're listening to me out here, uh, that's something you should know. All right, looks like we can see a few more of these tubes that we were uh, seeing earlier. Yeah, and up, yeah, just up above here, the star pilot. Just where the lasers are passing now, there's a black dot. I don't know if that's rock or something in that patch. Huh. Just, I guess, uh, just sediment pile around a little bit of a raise in that rock. Okay, thank you. May have been a little tiny polychaete on the front of the rock. Huh. Is that what you're well, it looked like that kind of rose structure you were in the sediments uh, we saw yesterday. The, uh, the what structure? It looked kind of like a little fold or, uh, what did you say? We saw it yesterday. In the sediment? Yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't even notice it. Uh, I'll think of it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I'm, I'm trying to. We still have seven days to go. <laughs> I'm trying to absorb your vast <laughs> biological knowledge of the deep sea. I just don't, have, I don't have all the words yet. Got it. <laughs> I, I wish I'd seen it myself. <laughs> uh. Didn't get to see any uh, entrop nooses yet, which are the uh, acorn worm. Um, Diva, I, I imagine that's something that you guys have seen um, over in the CCZ. Is this a, looks like there's a fish maybe coming into view on the left, the distance. Can't tell if it's on the bottom. I think it is on the bottom. Yeah. This might be something different, uh, Astrid. Oh yeah. Oh, well, it's definitely different. It's a lizard fish. That's right. It's a bad <laughs> I think Mackenzie taught me that one.
So we saw a uh, cusky eel earlier in the dive that had damage to its head as if something had bitten it. This is another candidate for uh, a fish that could have done that sort of damage because these are very strong predators, and if we get close enough, you'll see that the mouth is just full of a uh, great many sharp teeth. Uh, these are called deep water lizard fish. They're related, uh, distantly related to the shallow water lizard fish. This is Bathysaurus mollus, the species in the Pacific. There are two species in the Atlantic and around the uh, southern hemisphere. The other one's a dark colored species. There you can see these teeth, uh, very impressive, uh, full array wow. of sharp teeth on both jaws. Pretty intimidating looking. So kind of interesting, uh, very little pigment. Yeah, and most of the pigment is internal. You can see the pigment around the uh, gill cavity, and then they also have dark pigment around the gut, and that probably serves to mask any uh, bioluminescence that their prey items would have right. uh, to keep this predator from being less noticeable once it eats uh, something that produces light in this deep-sea environment. You can also see the highly reflective tapetum, the uh, uh, lining inside of the eye that uh, serves to collect light and function in this uh, sunless environment where the only light is bioluminescence. There are also enlarged lateral line pores, sort of cavities that we can see along the side of the body, there we go, uh, that hold the uh, sensory cells to detect vibration and pressure waves. Uh, so this fish is relying on a little bit of sight to sense bioluminescence, but even more so the uh, vibrations and pressure waves that its prey might uh, put through the water column. Great, thank you, Bruce. Yeah, you know, our, our ears are accustomed to sensing pressure differences. I, I believe as, as sound is propagated underwater, though, it's actually causing those water molecules to accelerate. And it's the acceleration into this lateral line, I think, is how um, an animal like this would probably sense sound. So a little bit different than, than how we do. We're happy. Yep, we've uh, got a lot of uh, excited comments. You can actually see the blood vessels and the fins there. <laughs> That's amazing. That's <laughs> the uh, quality of this imagery. It's remarkable. There are two species of these Bathysaurus. Um, Astrid was asking if we think it's uh, Bathysaurus mollus because of the light color, and yes, that's one uh, way to tell the two apart. The other one, Ferox, which is not known from the Central and North Pacific, uh, is this uh, is a darker color. Uh, one other character that we could see is uh, the mollus have an adipose fin, which is a very small tab-like fin toward the on the back toward the tail, and that fish had the adipose fin. And uh, Bathysaurus ferox, the larger, darker species, lacks that adipose fin. So this is one of the few cases where we can identify uh, a deep-sea fish uh, at these depths, uh, two species. Great. Thanks, Bruce.
Just changing a pilot and uh, getting on our way again here. It's probably a good time to remind you that this is the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer coming from coming to you from the Central Pacific and you can probably tell Joss is in the chair because he found some schmutz right away. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> couldn't resist. Um, so we're in the uh, Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument, the Jarvis Island unit doing our fifth dive in this area of the monument. And we're at a depth right now of 4,469 meters. I think we started about what, 4,600? Yeah, Something I think like so. That. Um, so our deepest dive, uh, our deepest dive in the monument and our deepest dive uh, for this expedition. What's this? This looks like a xenophyophore. So this is one of these single-celled amoeba-like organisms related to foraminifera. And I guess it's worth saying a lot of the little round balls that we're seeing in the sediments are actually pelagic foraminifera, their shells. So these organisms, xenophyophores, are able to incorporate various debris and sediment into what's called a test. You can kind of think of it as a shell. And the cytoplasm of the cell is kind of distributed throughout that flattened plate-like structure. They can, different species can build lots of different kinds of morphologies. And um, earlier, Diva Mon was telling us that uh, further to the east in the work they've been doing in the Clarion Clipper and Fracture Zone abyssal region, uh, they had collected, I think she said, 36 of these and 34 of them turned out to be new species, which is a really good indication that they're very undersampled. Um, relatively unknown in the deep sea, the diversity is unknown. And uh, part of that is because they're really hard to collect. They're very, very delicate. And so you can't use anything destructive like a, a trawl or a toad sled or anything like that. You have to be able to collect them in some delicate way. And with the ROV, of course, we can get this really nice imaging. Uh, Del Emil is uh, asking if we're on the edge of an abyssal hill. Yeah, great, great question, Emil. We're actually looking at the very western edge of uh, the Clipperton Fracture Zone, which goes all the way some 7,000 kilometers back to the modern East Pacific Rise. And this is a little area that um, looks like it's pushed up. So we're climbing something that would have been, um, this trend of this structure is really in the direction of plate motion. Um, and as plate motion may have changed through time, as these transforms and these fracture zones sometimes will push a little piece of the seafloor up where you might get a little basin that opens. And so that's really what we're climbing up. Um, we're getting a look at the rock face here, and we've seen this kind of uh, bluish gray mat, and it's it's something encrusting. We're not entirely sure what it is. Um, it could be a sponge. It could just be a bacterial mat that's incorporated some of the organic detritus that's settled down there. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff that's really hard to sample. You yeah, know, it's fixed in place. Again, you can see a lot of the sort of greenish brown flocculent material that's sitting on top of the sediments itself. And those are probably um, organics that have uh, fallen through the water column and collected here or have been resuspended from the bottom in other places and uh, redeposited. Uh, there's something white in the center of the screen, just going off the bottom of the screen below the lasers. It's above the pile of sediments. Not sure if that's a fish or a holothurian or. None of the above. A feather. <laughs> uh, it might be a sponge. Air, yeah. oh. Huh. What are we looking at there? Oh. It does kind of look like a feather, doesn't it? <laughs> I wonder if it's the tip of a crinoid arm or if it's trash. Video suggesting could it be the bones of a fish, a skeleton? Uh, no? Seems like they're too curved, but I suppose that's a possibility. Broken. Yeah, so, you know, Pilot, we've been seeing these dots, and I do not know what those are. Um, I think this is some of the things they see on the Marianas, and we're trying to figure out what they were, and I don't know if we ever came up with uh, an identification. Yeah, Astrid, that's the weird shiny marbles that we're referring to right now. <laughs> I don't know if it's some kind of... Uh, protozoan, another kind of uh, something related to a foram. No idea. So, yeah, I don't know. 
I don't know. I suppose that could be the vertebra of a fish. What do you think? Rib cage of a fish, folks? Surely. No, I don't think it's a sponge. No, That's what I thought at first. Out. Yeah, okay, Bruce. Yeah. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it sort of vaguely resembles a vertebrae and uh, associated bones of a fish, but it seems like the uh, uh, various parts are too close together uh, for a standard fish skeleton. So I'm not sure, though. We don't know much about the osteology of a lot of these deep-sea fishes, so it's a possibility. Yeah. I, I, I think maybe that might be a sponge. That's actually a xenophyophore, that uh, globular-like thing that you see. So before we just saw the platy like one. This ah. is one that formed kind of like a ball. Thank you. Um, it's a mystery. It's about eight <laughs> centimeters in length. Hopefully we'll see um, some more. Uh, on the left side, there's something pinkish right. It's like another sea cucumber. Yep, that's exactly what I'm referring to. I think we've actually now seen this a few times, but this one's got a bit of a coating of sediments on it. Doesn't seem to be moving too fast. Yeah, I saw that video. Thank you. I'm just waiting to see if uh, Diva has anything to say about this. I'm just looking it up. Hold on. Okay. So again, not one I'm familiar with, but I think it matches one in the Clarion Clipperton Zoo Megafauna Atlas online. Um, and they have it listed as Paleopatides morphotype orange. Paleopatides, thank you. Is, yeah, so that's in the family Cinelac today. Okay. So we're just looking over here to the right when we were coming in. We saw something that may have been a... Oh, I see that too. That's not the one I saw. Thank you, Roland. Uh, this is probably a polychaete tube. Um, again, this is the segmented worm that have the, uh, there's another black coral just uh, off to its left. So yeah, I'm pretty certain that this is what this is. Um, so uh, Diva, have you seen these um, sorts of tubes before? You, would you agree that this is a polychaete? It's got an amphipod on the tube. Looks like it's a tube that's made of mud, kind of glued together. Yeah, so we've seen these in the eastern Clarion Clipson zone, and this is probably a sabellid tube, which is a type of polychaete, and it's also known as a feather duster worm or fan worm. And basically, it sticks its head out of that tube and extends these feather-like projections, which it then uses to filter food out of the water column, such particles that may be suspended and floating by. Great. Thank you, Diva. So you can see a lot of stuff uh, actually associated with the bottom here. So this is interesting. So we've seen this black coral a couple of times. And um, I, d I neglected to point this out last time. When we were first seeing them, those curved branches were facing downwards. Yeah. These are facing upwards. The polyps are sort of forced to the outside. But also they have a real kink in the lower part of the stem, exactly like the last one we saw. Yeah, it's like a little sea seal there or something, right. yeah. And you can see that it's able to move around, so I wonder if it's able to sort of track the current. Uh-huh. You know, it's very flexible in that dimension. Thank you, pilot. Again, the, the polyps seem grossly large compared to the size of the skeleton and uh, larger than what I'm used to in seeing in other black corals. I still haven't seen it. <laughs> I believe you. Oh, there's a sea star. There's a purple sea star to the left of the lasers and above. Oh, yeah. That's a different one. I haven't seen that color before. This. Oh, this is, I think, a terrestrial, maybe a slime star. I'm quite certain that this is a slime star, which would mean that it has kind of a second layer of skin over it that can be kind of inflated. 
and it has um, what's called an osculum, same term that you're using a sponge, kind of like a little opening in the upper center there like a chimney. So I think that's what we're looking at. Well, I haven't heard from Chris Ma today, and it hasn't been much of any kind of dermy day, so no, maybe he hasn't seen anything really worth talking about. Uh, but we're getting good image of this. And so we may learn what something. What the heck? We saw loads of echinoderms that were worth talking about. <laughs> I, my bad. <laughs> I, I meant to, I meant to re restrict that comment to the class Asteroidea, Diva. <laughs> just, just can't. I know, I, I'm only messing. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know you are, and I deserve to be messed with. I'm going to strike the word just from my vocabulary. I also remember hearing when folks would say, if you're just joining us, and then, no, 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 if you have recently joined us. <laughs> yes, of course. You're not just joining us. <laughs> Why would anyone want to be anywhere else? I'm sorry, video, what are you directing me to? Oh, I see, yep. So this is another one of these six-armed ones. I think we've seen this a couple of times now. Yep, and it even has those same dark patches right near the central disk. So uh, we've definitely seen this on multiple occasions today. Thank you, pilot. Looks like something has been digging in the sediment up here. You can see that it's been overturned. Uh, can we get a zoom on the disturbed sediment just above the lasers, please? So something has yeah. been digging around here or um, I'm just going to throw this out as a hypothesis. So we have been seeing these feeding traces, and we've acknowledged that there are these burrowing urchins. So they're living just below the surface. And I could imagine that there are probably fish that want to feed on them, and so maybe they have to dig in a little bit to the sediments to get them. So that's maybe what we're seeing there. So we can go back and look at the sponge pilot. So just a note on the fish wallowing in the sediment. I have actually seen that in our uh, baited camera footage. I don't know if that was going on here, but I have seen the Zoarchy, the um, which tend to be on the bottom, wallow in the sediment, kind of disturb the uh, sediment. Great. Thank you, Astrid. I'm glad to hear that. So maybe that is indeed what we were just seeing there, a feeding trace of a fish kind of nosing around in the sediments. Um, and again, so we've seen this now a few times, and we're yeah. not certain if that's sponge or if that's, uh, you know, bacterial mat that's incorporated some organics. But it's definitely something above the rock. Yeah, and it's not it's not everywhere. It's very patchy like this. So yeah. yeah. There's some little guy, some little crustacean just above it to the left that's crawling, and I, when it's moving, it's a little bit easier to see what it is. I can't tell if it's an isopod or an amphipod. I believe it is an isopod. Probably uh, Munidopsid. Is it Munidopsid? Munidae. I get mixed up. There's a isopod family and a, a squat lobster family that have the sim similar names. And as you were zooming in, I noticed somewhere on the left, I'm going to miss it now, but there's a, a whip-like. Oh, there it is. So it's probably another bamboo coral. Um, we did make a collection earlier of a bamboo coral. I suspect that's what this is, but if we could have a quick zoom and we'll find out. And it's definitely a bamboo coral, but maybe you can remember. Were the polyps this sparse on the last one? No, they were. I, they, I, I think, think they were. So. They were denser. I think. Yeah, I think so too. And this one may have spines. Are those. Sp I think those are spines. What I'm looking for now is a reflection to see if I see the horizontal or the oblique sclerites, and I don't. I think this is a different one. So that's excellent. So that would be uh, two different species of bamboo coral down here. We're really deep. You know, we just noted that the one we collected was the second deepest ever collection made of a bamboo coral. 
Good stuff. Thank you, pilot. And I noticed a fish dangling in a water column on the left just as we were zooming. It's probably off screen to the left. Well, he's gone now. And an anemone and two barnacles. So the anemone we've seen, the barnacles are new. Yeah. There's a little tiny black coral also on the lower uh, Yeah, left, barnacles out yeah. there, yeah. Yep. So this is a couple of lepidomorph barnacles or gooseneck barnacles. And you can see the uh, leg-like cirrhi. There's three of them. There's one also on the left of the anemone. They seem to be pulling in. I guess they're feeling the thruster wash. So they're pulling in their legs to protect their feeding structures. So these are uh, relatives of shrimp and crabs that have taken up a different existence where they've actually glued themselves to the substrate and feed that way. Yeah, I think that's another one of the Octonema tunicate, tunicates. Yep. Oh, and there's a oh, snail yeah. on it. Oh, that is cool. On it, I think. Is that what that is? Or Maybe it's not a snail. Well, let's... <laughs> Let's study this a little bit more. You know what? Maybe that's that's part of the internal anatomy of the octonemon. So this is nice. We've been looking at it from the top. Now we're getting this nice side view. Yeah, so these are actually, it's, it's uh, organs that you're seeing. And I'm not sure what organ that is that has all those uh, dotted structures. It's kind of weird the way that looked like a snail. So again, this is a predatory tunicate. And so it's... Um, you can see now on this lower side, there's kind of a circle you can kind of make out, and that's where uh, the opening of this hood is. And normally that would be an in-current siphon that would pull in water and filter feed, but instead these sorts of folks, <laughs> folks, <laughs> these tunicates will kind of open like lips and capture prey items. Never actually seen them do that. That would be kind of fun. All right. Nice image. So uh, something about that particular ledge is yeah. attractive to various organisms. And I wonder if it's the flow kind of moving down that slope and curling around the ledge. Nav, does the watch lead? Yeah, I don't think we have any specific uh, ridge or crest in mind, nope. right, Del? Nope. Thank you. Yeah, we, from the mass we have, it's kind of a similar slope all the way up to the top, but it's a it's a long way to the top, so we won't we won't make it there today. But I will say that um, we are still hopeful that we will see a uh, loose rock. It uh, seems unlikely, but if we do, <laughs> we would certainly like to uh, poke it and pick it up. Absolutely. Always. Always hunting for rocks. I guess this has probably turned over sediment again, that white patch, and it's so stark. You know, <laughs> you can see where there's been some reworking. Um, of the bottom and we you know we talked on a couple of dives about bioturbation and the fact that animals are turning over the sediment digging in the sediment and this moves stuff from uh, the surface to deeper and so on Uh, Nav, you have interpreted that last uh, correctly. The, they attempted to put the spherules in one, and it uh, went into both bio boxes. That is a port side, correct? I saw another one of the uh, purple holothurians there on the left side. Oh, uh, purple pink. Uh, yep, another one of the uh, schizopathies black corals. They have this kind of V-like shape curled up. And Look like they're nicely funneling water so that all the polyps are getting access to some flow.
It might be more overturned sediment. Let's see. This is an isopod, I believe. So we, yeah. So it's, uh, the head is on the left side, and we were looking at a nice another isopod earlier, walking over the bottom. I don't know that this is the same one, but you can see it's got some very very long antennae that are raised up above it, and kind of being pushed back. Isopods are very close relatives of the amphipods and the mycid shrimp that we've been seeing, and uh, one isopod that or a couple of isopods you may be familiar with. One is a pill bug. If you live up in the New, uh, <laughs> New England, anywhere in the Northeast, you've probably seen pill bugs. And if you live by the seashore, you may have seen um, sea roaches or wharf roaches. Uh, they move really quick over the rocks. Those are also isopods. And all three of these groups that I've just mentioned, the isopods, amphipods, and the mycids, share a characteristic. They're all in a group along with some other crustaceans called paracarids, where they brood their young in a chamber uh, below the thorax. Oh, there you go. It had uh, exhibited what's called the caridoid response, and that is it's using its abdomen and flapping it really quickly so it can jet backwards hmm. and uh, escape predation. And shrimp and lobsters do that as well, and that's why we love them so much, because that tail is packed with muscle in order to do that swimming motion, and that's what we really like to uh, eat on, all that nice muscle. I just had some muscle for lunch, so. I, and so did I. <laughs> Thank you, caridoid response. I, sorry, were you going to say? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, fairly consistent geology here that we've, we've seen for most of the dive. Um, Oh, good. There we go. Nice view. It's a little uh, snailfish, I think. Yes, this looks a lot like a <clears throat> snailfish, but I see um, some very fine filamentous uh, fin rays on the belly of the fish that would be the pelvic fins. So I think this is a different kind of a cusk eel, an ophidiid. We've seen something like this on a couple of the other dives, uh, I think one in the Marianas, and we have no idea what this is. Uh, maybe Astrid or others have suggestions, but uh, this is one of our uh, mysteries. I'm not even sure that this is the same type of uh, fish, that um, the same type of Opadia that we saw in the Marianas. So I welcome any comments from Astrid. Um, if others think that it might be a snailfish, I'm open to that suggestion too, but those fine little filaments suggest to me an opadeid. I agree, so Jeff and I are saying uh, cut eel as well, so opadeid. I was thinking, what, what is the size on that? Could it be a juvenile, or do you think it is a... Uh... Oh, there's the lasers, yeah. So it's, it's not right that small. In, it's, um, no, it's in the foreground, and it, yeah, I think it's small. Yeah, it's yeah, very small. Body shape is reminiscent of the Basil Zetus with this like tadpole-like big bulbous head, but I think it's something different. So a uh, video is suggesting it's only about four centimeters in length, and I was going to follow up that question. Do you think it's a juvenile or is it a very small adult? Well, I would say that they're both possibilities. A number of these deep-sea fish grow to uh, only small sizes, so uh, there are small species. Uh, that's actually uh, a characteristic of certainly the um, uh, abyssal pelagic fishes, that they're generally small, uh, although a lot of the um, demersal fishes uh, grow larger. Uh, and it could be a juvenile, definitely. As far as we know, the ophidiids have a pelagic larval stage. A lot of them aren't up in the uh, sea surface. Some of them are, uh, and some of them have actually fairly spectacular larvae. And then they gradually transform, as most fish do, from the larval stage to a juvenile that begins to resemble uh, a small version of the adult through a gradual, through a transformation. So it could be either. Uh, it could be a juvenile or it could be a species that um, we don't know um, as an adult. Uh, it's another one of these mysteries, and we can't solve it without specimens. 
Thank you, Bruce. Um, and we are zoomed in now on a bamboo coral. And now you can clearly see reflected in the body of the polyp wall, there are these little white stripes, and they're quite short. And so these are the sclerites. These are the calcitic elements that the coral is able to produce and are one of the things that we use in um, identifying these to species. And so you got a good view that they definitely have some there oblique. And I noticed at the base of this, there was also another uh, barnacle, uh, stock barnacle. And then behind it, to the right, was another black coral, uh, one of the schizopathies fans that we've been seeing. So the corals are here. They're a little bit smaller and harder to see. But there's clearly enough food to support some of these things. So we were talking about this earlier, Dell, uh, this opportunity to, deep at, to dive at 4,500 meters with an ROV and get a close look at things is... Uh, does not come along every day, I can tell you that. I've only had, I think, a few of these dives to these depths. It's really exciting. No, we're really fortunate to have this vehicle. I think, you know, many many RVs are rated down to about uh, 4,000 meters. This one can go down to 6,000 meters. So it um, really lets us get a look at some of these unusual habitats. Some more turned over sediments here. I don't know if I've said it too many times, but you know, you've got all this fluff that's sitting on top of the sediments and where it's whiter, it's an indication that something has disturbed the surface of the sediment and it's probably digging in there and uh, overturning the sediments. And so it's evidence that uh, there's some been, been some biological activity right. uh, going on. And I see a whip here on the left, and there's a much smaller one that's curved on the right. And so they're both the bamboo corals again. Yeah, I wonder if the uh, polyps have been closed on this one. We'll get a quick view as we're going by. Actually, you know, this less to me, this is a really rigid one, and this looks like a sort of a what I call a classic Bathygorgia. It can't be too classic if it was only resurrected two years ago, but... Yeah, so the polyps have been closed up on this one. Wonder if something went by. Hmm. So all the tentacles have been sort of pulled in and reduced. Yeah. So you just see little mounds here protecting, um, protecting the tentacles. But it is indeed a bamboo coral, probably by the gorgia. Um, there's two golf ball like or larger structures behind to the left oh i see i can see it better now okay so these are all xenophyophores. for us that's fine we don't need to get a look at those uh, we were describing those earlier as the uh, large single-celled uh, protists that are able to incorporate sediments into their test so we've seen at least two different types maybe more i'm not sure how to identify them all but we've seen some that have that very round globular shape and some that have more erect plate-like shapes we, uh, I think we're coming down to our last hour, right, of uh, bottom time? Yep, about uh, 65 minutes or so here. Mm -hmm. So here you see a bamboo coral with the polyps now, uh, the tentacles fully everted, or extended is a better word. They don't invert, but so extended is a better one. So this is in the, basically in a feeding position. The other one appears to have been disturbed by something and kind of contracted those uh, tentacles up. Now... Let's see if we can, s so here, this looks to me like the sclerites are in a different position than the one we just looked at. So I have a feeling that this is a different species than that other one. The other one, I'm quite certain, is Bathygorgia. Not too sure about what I'm looking at here. We'll see if we get any input from shore. Thank you, uh, pilot. Behind it, yeah, what is that? I was hoping you wouldn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really interesting. I believe that is a polychaete. Uh, greatly extended from its tube. And so I wonder if we just moved maybe a bit to the left or the right, if we'd see the head end of it. We can see there's kind of the dirty sort of brownish tube that's connected to the rock. And then there's something that's much more tissue extended. Yeah, it's very small. Yeah, that's, that's going to be a polychaete worm. Oh, and there's a holothurian right in front. Oh, yeah, didn't you see it? Yep. Yeah. Well, so that's cool. So now we know for certain that these are uh, polychaetes that are building these tubes. So again, that's a kind of worm, an annelid worm.
Cool. It's kind of amazing when you see some of these, what you think are very simple invertebrates and the constructions that they can build. I, I, I'm constantly wondering how it is that a single cell can build a ball or a plate. <laughs> Yet they do. All right. So Les says these are probably all the same species, but I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be averse to getting another piece. I'm sure of that. Uh, they are quite different from the other Bathogorgias or probably new. Here looks like a feeding trace. You can see that line in the sediment. There might be something up at the end of it. Maybe another lizard fish, top of the screen center. So feeding trace and then something at the end of it. Wouldn't it be cool if that was a lizard fish eating <laughs> I was gonna uh, say, an urchin? Now we know why these traces end, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Is that just a rock? Wow, yeah. <laughs> a rock with an eyeball? <laughs> yeah, it's just a rock. Boy, it sure looked like a fish. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Cool. All right. Disregard all previous comments. It's still a feeding trace. I'm going to stick with that. that. That part's true, yeah. Yeah. Uh, front row, please uh, introduce yourselves if you haven't already. I don't think you have. So this is Josh, Joshua Carlson. I'm piloting D2 right now to my right. Levi Yenema as co-pilot. To my left. Sean Kennison sitting nav. And to my far right. Ronald Bryan. And, who is and on clipping, I'm Emily Nero, and we're all with the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. We got a few. Uh, oh, let's go ahead and have a look at this. I don't know. Another one of the tunicates. The octonemid tunicates, the predatory tunicates. One thing that's interesting is I haven't seen any of the filter feeding tunicates down here. Can't say for certain that I've seen them uh, anywhere. Has that got an anemone growing on the outside of it? Or am I looking at more internal anatomy? I think it's not growing on the outside. Yeah, the, some, sometimes, certainly in the deep sea, the tunicates can be very hard to separate out from some of the sponges uh, when they're encrusting. That's good, pilot. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we had a few uh, questions on social media here that just got forwarded. A um, couple, couple about these manganese crusts. Um, one here is what what are these rocks around these corals? And so this is a brasinia that's definitely different. I think I'm trying to remember now. We've seen a lot of different things today. 
but anyway, this is a Brasingid sea star um, in the Asteroidia. It looks like it might have a worm on the back side of it there. Um, and something has, at some point in the not too distant past, eaten some of its arms. You can see that one, two, three, four, five, six arms are considerably shorter than the others. And they do have the capability of regenerating arms, so there may have been some predation event. Uh, but I'm kind of curious about what's going on in that back arm. Of course, it's always the back. <laughs> Hi, Scott. It's Chris Kelly. Hi, Chris. I'm going to do a Chris Ma imitation here. So um, one of the things I recently learned from him is that you can differentiate uh, frailty from brisingity by looking at the arms. Maybe that's Chris now. Is that Chris? I guess not. But anyway, I would guess that this is uh, in the family frailty rather than brisingity because um, it's lacking some of the uh, really distinctive uh, ribbing on the arms themselves that characterize the brisingids. There's just a little bit of it there. Plus, the frailids are much, much deeper generally, and they are uh, many of them are white like this as well. Thank you, Chris. Well, just to make things confusing, both of those families are in the order Brasingida. <laughs> so uh, that is a polychaete. That is a scale worm. Earlier we saw a fairly large scale worm that was just sitting on the bottom. I think this is a different species, and I'm suggesting that because the scales you see don't quite meet in the center. They're a little bit further spaced apart. And there's another polychaete on the rock on this side, uh, slightly to the uh, left. All right. Thank you. Another one of the xenophyophores, that yeah. golf ball-like structure that was tucked away there in the rock. Yeah, so a few, a few of our questions here from um, online. Uh, Susan Moore is asking, are these lava rocks around all these beautiful corals? You know, she called the corals beautiful, not the rocks beautiful. <laughs> It's all right. We'll, we'll forgive you, Susan. Uh, <laughs> the answer is that all of this seafloor that we're looking at was actually formed at a, a at a volcano at a at a mid ocean ridge spreading center, which you can think of as a giant volcano. Uh, because we're in a fracture zone here, some of what we're looking at may actually have cooled under under the crust, but the upper part of this would have erupted as as lava and, and then cooled, of course. So on the lower right. And that might be a sponge. The two on the left here, the golf ball size things, these are the xenophyophores again. These uh, single-celled relatives of the foraminifera. Actually, this is another one and just has a different morphology. You can see it's an upright plate fan shape. Uh, but again, it's uh, largely constructed from sediment grains, but also from uh, uh, basically poop from the single cell uh, that it incorporates into the into that test. So here we have wow. another sea cucumber, very transparent. You can see the internal anatomy. And I think we've seen this one a couple of times today. Thank you. I believe they call, uh, call it uh, Sturkomeres and Sturkomata. Uh, somebody online, um, one of the folks in the chat room can correct me if I'm wrong in that term, but that refers to basically the cell waste of undigested uh, remains that are extruded from the cell and are also incorporated into that test along with the sediment grains. So what other questions do you have? We got another one here from Larry Riley's asking about the manganese crust and the role of bacteria might play in forming them. This is this is actually a area that's still open open for debate. My understanding is that uh, that bacteria will accelerate the rate of manganese being oxidized, but um, it's still a, a bit contentious whether or not we would really think of these as sort of uh, biogenic deposits or whether these are more natural um, precipitates here on, on these rocks. So one thing is for sure: we need to have an exposed surface to form these here. You see the crust are all over the exposed rocks. We don't see the crust forming on top of the of the sediments. Um, and that's one of the reasons we find it on these escarpments. We've been finding these crusts on these um, seamounts as we've been going around. It's an interesting question. Uh, we're learning so much about what the microbial world is capable of doing in terms of their physiology and their metabolism. And 
um, with the advent of, or the advancements that we've had in genomics and being able to do a lot of sequencing and then comparing what um, sort of unknown genes you have to genes that are known and realizing when you have something that may allow for a different function and then trying to understand what it's doing. Uh, maybe we'll learn more in that way about if right. there are any of these microbes that can contribute to deposition of manganese. It wouldn't surprise me. Those microbes seem to do everything. <laughs> but then the question would be, yeah, what's the relative contribution of the uh, microbial deposition versus the natural deposition? All right, so Pilot, we have a, um, some ROV-related questions here, too. One that we came in the other day we didn't get to is, um, what, what's more challenging, a deep dive or a shallow dive? Great, thanks, Josh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm not holding not too much hope here. Well, yeah, so you know, underneath this crust, we we think we're looking at this exposure of the of the ancient ocean crust that would have been pushed up along this fracture zone and uh, maybe just say say a little bit about these fracture zones in general this one we're looking at you know it's a it's a massive tectonic feature it runs all the way from we are over at 162 degrees west over the east pacific rise which is around a, a 95 to 100 degrees west so it's more than 7,000 kilometers um, these have been really important in understanding the tectonics of the of the planet um, since we first started to think about plate tectonics they give us a their orientation tells us direction of plate motion, and we can actually look at how they change through time, where we get little places like this that are pushed up or pulled apart. Um, tells us something was going on with plate reorganization. That's been really important as we've, through the years, tried to sort out the, the tectonics of the Pacific Basin and, and other ocean basins. And uh, if this were a little bit younger and didn't have this crust, you know, we'd be able to actually go in here and, and sample um, different sections of the crust. And we've been able to do that in some active transforms, uh, much younger exposures, um, with a lot of success. That's one of the main ways we know about the architecture of the seafloor is looking at these, what we call tectonic windows. As we're moving up the slope here, we have a little bit of a break from all the uh, biology we've been talking about. Um, let me give you some, uh, just a review of where we've uh, come so far. Um, tomorrow we have a transit day, so we will have one day off before our next set of dives. So 
just uh, as good a time as any for a bit of a review. So, so far in the expedition, we've explored the deep water in the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa. We did a dive in the uh, Anu'u unit. Um, I think there's a anemone just to the left of the laser. See, I know this is always the way to find biology. I start to do a review and then we're going <laughs> to see something. It's in the sediments. Sure. Great. Yeah, these two left of the laser are tantalizingly saying, eh. <laughs> That's what we thought about the last two. We tried yes, that it is. We'll see. Yep. Oh! oh he's got the magic touch. <laughs> well, we'll just take both of them. <laughs> if you can get them, yeah. Well, that one too, then, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, give, give him a squeeze here. I guess. Oh, there. I think we're going to lose our rocks. We're going to lose our rocks. Yeah. <laughs> Crush. We, we don't have a lot of choice here, so we'll squeeze one and see what happens. So. Yep. Well, that's true. You got two. That's good. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, nice. Yeah, let's put, it, put it in there. Oh, like that's that. exciting. Yeah, we can take a little look at it. We'll, we'll, yeah, you get, there you go. Not not too big there, so. But we'll take what we can get here. We haven't. Um, wouldn't be our ideal sample candidate usually, but. Um, Sometimes we'll, while we're down here, we might as well grab these two rocks if we can. So this is spec five. So let's see, we've got the bamboo coral, we got the sponge, we got the spherules. Isn't this four? How come I already have a four listed? Uh, I don't know, maybe you got ready with dive eight, dive eight. Oh, that's why. I yeah. said, okay, thank you. There you go. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we went into, uh, yeah, spec four, correct? Spec four, spec four right. geo. And that went in uh, starboard forward rock box. Right there. We got two rocks. I guess there was something about those rocks. I was just calling out to Josh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm loose. Yeah. Rock whisper. <laughs> oh, that one's got some little f arborescent foram in it. So, so Chris, I should say that I've yet to find the rock hammer on the on the ship here. So, if if you know where it's hidden, <laughs> please please reveal its location. That was in the training video, right? It was not in the training video. Uh, there was a, it alluded to the fact there would be a rock hammer. Huh. Sounding sounding like you're saying rock camera, but oh, you're saying a ha rock hammer. Hammer. Yeah, hammer. Yes. Let's see. So yeah, this is more transparent than the one we saw earlier. The tentacles are much longer relative to the size of the oral disc, which is that flat part in the middle where the mouth is, and the size of the mouth is also larger relative to the oral disc. So I think we have at least two different kinds of anemones today. I can't tell if one of those tentacles is actually stuck in the mouth of the uh, anemone. Yeah. So that could suggest that it was able to capture something on one of the tentacles. The tentacles are filled with these uh, stinging cells that should paralyze their prey, and then it could transfer it to the mouth. See another polychaete tube sticking out of the bottom there. Mm -hmm. I imagine were we to look in the sediments, we'd be seeing all kinds of stuff. Yeah, sure ah. enough. Look at that. So that's definitely kind of licking off the tip of the <laughs> tentacle. So that would suggest that it had recently captured something and has maybe just deposited it into the mouth. Cool. So 
So I was giving you a little bit of a review. So I'd said our first dive was in the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa. We did the Anu'u unit. We did a shallow dive from about 300 meters, 400 to 300 meters or so. Then we dove in the high seas just north of the Cook Islands Marine Park, Mary Moana. We did uh, two dives there, one on a seamount, about 2,500 meters. And then we dove on a ridge that had been previously unmapped, and the mapping team here on board mapped the feature, and we were all very surprised to discover we thought we were going to be doing a deep dive yeah. at about 3,500 meters, and then it turned out after we did the mapping that the feature came up something like 1,000 meters. It wasn't yeah. 900 meters, I think, at its shallowest point. Am I making that up? Uh, maybe not quite that shallow, no, but yeah, okay. it was 1,000. 21, it was yeah, at least 1,000 meters shallow. At least 1,000 meters shallow than we thought, yeah. and that was, uh, yeah, some beautiful rocks on that one. Yep. And let's see. It's just, it just kind of looks like winnowed sediments. I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Yeah. Um, and then following those two dives, uh, we moved up into the um, the monument that we're working in now, the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument, the Jarvis Unit. We've done five ROV dives in different places in this monument, and uh, we've seen a lot of really cool stuff. We did uh, two shallowish dives, one uh, quite shallow for about 800 meters up to 400 meters on the slope of John, uh, Jarvis Island itself. Um, just some spectacular biology, very dense, lots of diversity. Um, real exciting dive and uh, if you have a look at our website you'll see a couple of uh, an update and um, a mission log about that site with some uh, fantastic photographs of some of the stuff that we saw. And today we are doing our final dive in the uh, monument and we're down here at uh, started about 4,600 meters now we're about 4,400 meters we'll have a transit day tomorrow and then we'll be doing what six more dives in a row up in the Kingman Palmyra area right so if you've heard of uh, Palmyra Atoll um, I'll just take a breather there to say that we're looking at a polychaete worm tube again and so these uh, polychaetes can build tubes um, from a combination of mucus and the surrounding uh, particles in the sediment and then they live in this tube uh, presumably it's a protective. The tube will extend down into the sediment and then they can stick the head end out and eat some of this flocculent material around them. So yeah, we're moving up to uh, Palmyra next and uh, Palmyra Atoll is considered one of the most pristine environments in uh, shallow water and we're excited to see what the deep water will reveal. And we're going to be doing a variety of uh, dives from 2,500 meters all the way up to about 300 meters, I believe, in uh, the Kingman Palmyra area. So um, it'll be really interesting to compare to the similar depths range that we've done mm -hmm. further south and also to what's known about uh, Kingman in shallower water. So please uh, join us for that starting the day after tomorrow.
Copy that now, co-pilot. Welcome to the hot seat, Levi. <laughs> and we, uh, I think you've been listening along and know we're just sort of transiting up here and looking for uh, different sorts of interesting biology. And I'll let you know if there's something that uh, is really exciting that we haven't seen before. Thank you. Yeah, so we keep seeing these uh, sort of golf ball or ping pong ball like structures in the sediments. And you can see two below the ledge and there's one coming up here in a really nice position. And again, these are constructions made by single celled animals called Xenophyophores. There's another whole group called Camochiaceans. I don't think they make quite as nice a round structure. But you can see that that ball has the same composition as the sediments that it's sitting in, and that's because the cell that is composed it is basically picking those sediments up and gluing them together around itself. Yeah, so this is another one of the uh, anemones that we've seen that has this uh, kind of sunken oral disc. And relatively long tentacles, fairly transparent body. Thank you, pilot. Oh, just below it, um, that's our first view of an aplacophorin today. So that wormy-like thing, uh, not that's another worm. That's good, too, actually. So the white thing that you're seeing is a calcareous tube that has been built by a different kind of worm and you can see just coming out of the tube there's a little fan of tentacles and earlier Diva Amon was describing that tube that was coming out of the sediment she said it belonged to a sabellid or a fan worm um, and this is an example of a fan worm that builds a tube out of calcium carbonate and so that's a serpulid polychaete and then just under the anemone you see there's something that's kind of beige in color that looks like a worm but it's actually a mollusk it's more closely related to a snail than it is to a worm and these are specialized predators of corals and uh, hydroids and i don't know that they're predators of anemones but uh, i haven't seen any corals in the near vicinity but we have seen several of these on corals feeding on them thank you great view Just added a couple more new observations, Del. This found an apocophrin mollusk and a uh, serpulid polychaete, which is a fan worm that builds its tube from calcium carbonate. And so we were talking about the CCD earlier. Oh, excellent! Yeah. Yeah. So it hasn't uh, hasn't dissolved yet. Huh? It has not dissolved yet. Do you want to tell? Uh, Remind people what the CCD is that we're talking about? Yeah, so the carbonate compensation depth, um, and essentially it, um, how soluble calcium carbonate is depends on um, temperature and pressure. And so at certain depths in the ocean, uh, we would expect the rate of um, calcium deposition, calcium carbonate deposition, to be greater than its dissolution. And so we could build up 
carbonate rocks. And if we go to greater depths than that, we'd expect those rocks um, or those shells to dissolve faster, perhaps, than they were they were forming. So I think uh, we're about to zoom in here to a bamboo coral, which um, we've described several times has this nodal structure. That is, you'll see these black stripes that are made of protein, or black bands, I should say, and then you'll see intervals that are called internodes that are white, and those are made of calcium carbonate. And so this would be another organism that would face that same problem of the rate of dissolution being faster than the rate of deposition. Now, it's entirely covered by tissue, and so that's going to be one factor right. that might help it protect. But I'll be really interested. We collected one of these earlier today, and I'm going to be really interested to see how strong that skeleton is when we get it on board the ship. Yeah, we should be just right down down to that transition. So this yeah. it, this looks to me, is it a nodal branch? Uh, well, so it's not branching. No, not, not branching. Oh. Correct. So it's got the nodes, nodes. but the, uh, there's no oh, branches. I mean, and so. Yeah, there's no, okay, there's no branches. Yeah, I see Correct. the nodes there, though. Right. Thanks, pilot. So that looked to me, again, like another version of the thing that we collected that uh, we're at least giving the provisional name uh, Bathy Gorgia. And I, I, I think it's also worth reminding everybody who's listening that uh, we've indicated that we are, let's see, let's check out this floating thing. There it is. That is a polychaete worm. We're kind of looking at it head on. So this is yet another version of the uh, annelid worms that have these very long bristle-like uh, structures, uh, paddles sticking out of the side of the body. You can see the antennae coming towards us. Those are sensory structures. So we've seen several that build tubes. We saw some of the scale worms that had the scales in the back. This is yet another different kind. Um, there's tremendous diversity within the uh, polychaetes. If we can go off of the floating thing, and as you're coming down, okay, that pool of sediments just above the lasers now, there's something purple sitting in there, I think. Really small against the rock. Is that a sea star? I mean, it's tiny. It's right in the lower center of the screen. Wow. Yep, no problem. I mean, that's so small. I'm not entirely sure how I saw that, but. Just to show you that uh, everyone has a different perspective on what we're looking at there. As I was describing the polychaete, Bruce Monday was noting it was fish food. <laughs> I'm not sure if this was a tiny sea star or if it was something else. Oh, it's a t I think it's a pteropod shell, which means it's something else, which means it's really tiny. Um, if it is a pteropod shell, it's quite new. Oh, there's another polychaete walking over the bottom. Um, pteropods are a kind of pelagic or water column mollusk, and they swim through the water column um, and then when they die, they produce these shells, and the shells settle, and the shells make up a lot of the uh, substrate, a lot of the sediment. Sorry, and I'm losing my words because I saw something even more interesting up on the face <laughs> of this rock. If you just pan up a little bit. Right there. Yep. So is this that bryozoan again, or is this a sponge this time? It's sort of hard to tell from this yeah. perspective. It's really tiny. It's kind of the width of it is very similar to that Bryzo one. Yeah, overall. I mean, the, the, the size, you know, that's yeah. kind of what I feel. All right. That's good, pilot. Thank you. I think I was waxing poetic on something, and I totally forget what it was. It wasn't the CCD.
Yeah, so it's coming down to our last, uh, I guess, 25 minutes or so here of bottom time. So we're going to just keep going up the, the ridge here. I think um, this sea cucumber is the one that uh, Diva Moan earlier suggested might be penny agony. Or, and I'm forgetting the other, oh, Amparina. Amparina or penny agony. You can see we're looking at it from behind, and you can see up front there's that little kind of uh, fin or sail that stands up. And uh, that can catch the currents. And this is one of the ones that we see um, swimming in the water column from time to time. Oh, yeah. So there's a really small crinoid, stock crinoid here. Um, this is a relative, actually, of that holothurian that you see up above. Um, also a relative of the brittle stars and the sea stars and the urchins. And these are commonly known as sea lilies. And they are... Um, on these elongated stalks and have these uh, kind of feathery-like arms that they use to capture food from the water column. It's a really small one. Yeah, m much smaller than some that we've been seeing on our previous dives. Might be uh, no right on the lasers now. It might be that more of this material that's overgrowing the rock. Yeah, there's a snail just below it um, that's alive. I can see its foot, so let's have a look at that instead. We've looked several times at this kind of encrusting stuff, and we can't figure out what it is. 
Looks like there's a little recruit. That's a cup coral okay. that's just starting to grow. That little circle that you see at the lower edge just went off the top of the screen. But here's a live snail. You can see its foot extended from the shell. And it is headed downwards on that rock. You can see there's a little bit of a siphon extended from it. And I think that's a fine view. You can also now see on the about 2 o'clock from that snail, there's a little circle that's white. That's a little tiny cup coral that's recently recruited. You're seeing the skeleton and the live tissue is very, very faint. And if you'll pull out just a little bit, if the video is okay, there's something else on the lower right as we were coming in. Um, maybe what I saw was that, maybe it's another cup coral. So go ahead between the lasers, just above the lasers. So I think this is the same thing that we just saw up above there in that encrusting stuff. And now you can see from the sides, you can very clearly see that there's a skeleton to the left side against the rock that's white. And then you can see more transparent the tentacles arising from it. So mm. really nice view of a cup coral. So a cup coral is a stony coral. It's solitary. It doesn't form a colony. And you can see those white lines in there. Right. Yeah, so those are the scleroscepta. And I had been saying a few times in earlier dives something about the scleroscepta, and those are used in the taxonomy to help identify these things. So you can identify them even from the skeleton. Thank you, pilot. Uh, pilot, just below the lasers to the right, there's a dark black line on the rock. It's a feeding trace. And let's see if we can see a chitin at the end of that trace. Yeah, we haven't seen one of these in a little while, have we? No, well, we did see one today, so yeah, we, we shouldn't say in a little no, while because well, we hardly ever see that's them. That's true. <laughs> we haven't seen the traces even in a, oh, in a little while. Me. Right, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. We did see one chitin. And I don't see anything at the end of any of those traces, so... Okay, thank you for that. There is a chitin on the left, just on oh. the edge of the screen. Oh, there really? he is. Wow, good, good oh, eye, good. Bruce. Well yeah. done, Bruce. Excellent. There we go. So every time we see this and we see a chitin, we're getting a little bit more evidence that supports this hypothesis that is these uh, chitins that are actually creating these trails. And what they're doing is they have a... Uh, kind of like a sandpaper rasping, you can call it a tongue if you want, it's called a radula, and they scrape the surface of the rock, and they're probably feeding on bacteria that's on the rock, as well as some of this organic material that's settled. So these are uh, mollusks, fairly closely related to uh, snails, and you can see there are seven or eight plates there, and in the snails, of course, those plates are fused into one, that would be the shell of the snail. In uh, clams and oysters, there are two shells. Thank you. We had two mollusks right here. We had a snail and a chitin. There you go. And we just saw an apocopherin a little while ago, so we're hitting the uh, various... We're, we haven't gotten yet to the mollusk flush. We talked about the echinoderm flush. We've done that, but we haven't done it yet with the gastropods. We've seen the cephalopod. Okay. We even seen the scaphopod. That's one of the hardest ones ever to see. We've seen the gastropod snails. We have seen... Um, Chitons. Right. We have seen apicophorans. So all we're missing are bivalves. You'd think that'd be pretty simple. Yes. Uh, yeah. Or did we see a scallop? Uh, not not uh, on this Kay dive. Casey's I think you in. saw a bivalve shell. I don't oh, think you saw it. a bivalve. No, I think you saw a bivalve shell. We got to see shell. a live one for it to count. One. Okay. Good point. Um, but then probably the hardest is a monoplacophoran. But they saw one on leg one. We saw three or four. We actually tried to collect it with the uh, scoop, <laughs> so unsuccessfully, but. They were thought to be extinct until the 1950s. That's how hard they are to find. Ah. But wasn't that also the case with sea lilies? Sure. And stocked crinoids? Yeah, once you get in the deep sea, it's amazing what you find. So here's a sea star. 
This is definitely a different one for the at least the day, not the expedition. Yeah. Uh, Chris Kelly, are you still with us? I'm here, Scott. What do you think? Kind of interesting plates on this one, isn't it? Very, very rounded yeah. plates. Um, I'm here, Scott. <laughs> That's as far as you're going, I guess. I, I guess a, a goni ass is a good guess with the five arms. Um, I have no clue. I've never seen one like this before. Yeah, a really interesting pattern on the uh, of the scaling on the... Uh, what they call the aboral surface, meaning away from the oral surface. The mouth is oppressed down toward the rock and these sea stars. Cool. Well, if uh, that doesn't get Chris Mayo to bed, we know he's not paying attention <laughs> today. So thank you for that, pilot. Scott, I had an Antipatharian question for you since we're uh, just transiting at the moment, trying to find something else, if you got a second. Absolutely. Go ahead, Chris. What's the question? Hello. Is it Scott? Oh, so you haven't gone to bed yet, Chris. No. I <laughs> just Scott. saw the Joni Asterid yeah, um, just a moment ago. I don't know how far ahead of, of that you are. <laughs> not, not very far, so please tell us a little bit about it. Um, well, uh, I, I've yet to see the other goni asteroid that we collected on that first leg, but I think this is that same goni asteroid that we saw um, a few months ago when um, when Santiago was... was um, remember when they were uh, trying to collect that, that goni asteroid every time I saw it was new and I wanted... <laughs> to collect it, and yeah. then everybody kept on trying really hard to get it, and then eventually they got it. That's the same one. Oh, cool. Um, it doesn't have the spines in, in view, but it has that same weird surface texture. Um, so I, I think that might have been another record of this new animal. I haven't, like I said, I haven't had a chance to examine the specimen yet. Hopefully it's not something totally unrecognizable, you know, from... from from the imagery that I that, that we have specimens of already, but I think I think it looks pretty safely like a new uh, representative of that same animal, um, and you know hopefully it'll be a new um, species as well. So uh, it's been a really interesting dive. I apologize for not sort of speaking up. I've been trying to take care of some some uh, work, but. Um, uh, but you've seen a lot of really nice uh, deep sea sea stars today, and if there were any that um, you know you really wanted to know more about, I can fill you in. Just remind me which one. Great, uh, thanks, Chris. Let me ask you first. So we're talking about this goni asteroid that we just saw, and that you said that you think is uh, very similar to what Santiago collected. What depth were they working at? I mean, we're at four thousand three hundred and eighty-two meters right now. Yeah, that was about. That was. It was below a thousand meters. That was what made it so unusual, because most goni asteroids occur um, in the sort of 100 to I don't know 800 meter range, and um, you see a lot of the cookies, you know, the sort of pentagonal goni asteroids in relatively shallow waters. And this one was really deep. It was in the 1,000 to 3,000 meter range. Um, if this is, uh, as you say, four four thousand. Um, then that would be about right. It might be the lower end, but I honestly don't remember the full range of, of um, how deep we saw the one that was collected by uh, Santiago. But the only asteroids in the abyss are relatively um, uh, few. Um, you know, I described a couple of them in a paper uh, earlier this year, but, um, but like I said, I, these are, are new to me, these little cookie things. Um, I didn't get a chance to see the scale, but I suspect that was a fairly tiny one. Um, the only other things that, that I would expect to be down here are things like porcelain asteroids. And usually when you see those, well, you usually don't see them because they're buried in the sediment. Um, and they usually have some kind of epiproctal cone, which is a, 
a sort of um, uh, conical uh, uh, area that sticks up above the mud. And when you see them alive, they're usually covered with sediment and so forth. And this doesn't have that. This has, has an unusual texture on the surface that looks, I don't know, I, I, I'm curious to see what it is when I actually see the animal. So um, it's a fairly distinctive surface texture. Uh, but, um, you know, definitely uh, the, that surface texture is, to me, what gives it away. Um, so, but yeah, abyssal goniasterids are, are definitely sort of a, um, you know, they're, they're a rare, they're, they're something that I'm really looking forward to seeing <laughs> because, because I just don't see them very frequently. So, um, you know, the more that we poke around at this depth, the more we see these very unusual animals, especially since they're, they're not terribly large. So, um, so we'll see what happens. But, but there were a lot of a lot of interesting things, but that one really... Um, uh, the only asteroids were my, my PhD thesis uh, subject, so uh, I've got a long love affair with them. <laughs> we can tell that, Chris. Um, so... We haven't seen all that many sea stars today, so I think that backs up what you're saying about them being fairly unusual in the abyssal depths. But uh, let me just ask you about one more and um, maybe try to keep the answer brief because we're uh, getting towards the end of the dive. Uh, but we saw that purple, what I thought was maybe a uh, terrastid uh, slime star. And oh, yeah. Yeah, you were right. Um, and I saw that, and I figured you were on the right track, so why... why why interrupt? Okay, um, hang on, hang I on just a second, Chris. Hymenast, or, or a juvenile of Hymenaster. Um, it had a lot more skeletal uh, um, stuff going on on the surface. Usually, when we see Hymenaster at this depth, the superdorsal membrane is a big um, cream puff. Chris, I mean, can I interrupt you for a second? Membrane calcified. That actually had a lot of paxilla, lots of skeletal function performed to it. So. Um, you know, uh, I get the impression it was either really small or possibly it could have been something new. Stand um, by, Chris. We have old. something else that we want to describe here. Um, uh, yeah, so hang on a second there, Chris. Uh, we're looking at a polychaete tube with the fan extended, and I just wanted to say something about it because uh, I think we were looking at the tube earlier, but we didn't see the end of the worm. So this is really neat. Um, Diva was describing it. So we've seen several polychaetes today, these annelid worms related to earthworms, and they have these bristles on the side. And it's a huge diversity, that group. Oh, my goodness, there's an apocophoran mollusk on this tube further down. But, okay, focus on the worm. Um, why I want you to see this is it looks a lot like a crinoid, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. And basically, there's a convergent morphology among many different animals to have these structures that can get up into the water column, kind of like a fan, and fish stuff out of the water column. And so you can see that if we pulled it out, it would look just like a worm, except its head has got this very unusual kind of <laughs> fan on it. Um, so if we can get one more zoom, uh, just a little bit lower in the tube there, I think that's another one of these worm-like aplicopher mollusks. How interesting. Um, I'm surprised at how many we're seeing of these. I thought they were not quite so well known. Um, I guess we're getting good views in the deep sea so we can see them. All right, uh, great stuff. Sorry to interrupt you there, Chris. I um, just wanted to take advantage of this okay. while we could see it on the screen. Anyway. Um, but, uh, no, very exciting, of course, to see apocoprins and the sabellid worms as well. Um, and certainly a, a great panoply of holotherians and sea cucumbers, sea cucumbers today. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much, and um, enjoy your transit day tomorrow. And uh, I'll certainly tune in uh, a day from now to see all of the new things from Palmyra. Great. Thank you, Chris. Great to hear from you. Thank you. Sorry to have been so quiet. No problem. All right. That was uh, Chris Ma from the Smithsonian Institution, who is uh, obviously a aficionado of the sea stars and uh, various other kinds of echinoderms. And... Um, Chris writes a really excellent uh, blog called the Echino Blog and teaches us lots of interesting and fun facts about various types of echinoderms and other little deep sea bits. And he's got an interesting Twitter feed as well. 
Um, looks like we're coming up to the last seven, eight minutes of this dive. I found it quite interesting, actually. They're, I mean, the density is not high, but we're seeing different things right. that we've seen before, and we've seen some interesting biology. Yeah, we had no, no problem finding things we wanted to collect, that's for sure. Yep. I think a few people are holding out for a, a fish finale here, so <laughs> uh, we'll see what we can do, guys. It's not too late for an intrapneust <laughs> or an urine or a sea pen. And if we're going on that white structure, that is yet another one of these uh, xenophyophores, single-celled uh, amoeba-like protists. Quite remarkable. You can see, again, all this stuff over the rock. and I wonder if it's just microbial in origin. Copy that, Neff. Thank you. Oh, you're talking to pilots. Well, thank you anyway. Yep, good eye. It looks like an anemone. We're looking at it from the side. You can see the uh, body column attached to the rock. It's got a lot of uh, warts on it. You can see that it's got two rings of tentacles, essentially. One set that are up and one set that are down. And there you got to see it retract somewhat. Oh, is that right? Oh, cool. Yeah. Gives us a better view of the body column, actually. More identifiable characters. Not sure. There might be a snail tucked down in there on the uh, left side, really tiny. Oh, and there's a... Is that another chitin? No, that's a... No, maybe that is a chitin. If you can go up just a little bit, yeah. Can't tell uh, if that's a worm or a chitin from here. Let's see. All right, one... Tiny one, one. Uh, no, it's got too many Jimmy. plates, so that's a polychaete worm. Um, it wouldn't have more. I, I, I should know this. It should be seven or eight plates, and I should know. I'm going to have to look it up, so I'm ready tomorrow Kay. or the next day. But Never know when we'll see another chitin. There you go. If you look it up, we won't see one, though, probably. So you don't, don't, maybe right. you don't want to do that. It's horribly embarrassing if I can't remember the number of plates on a polypocophron. I know you don't think so. I'm, I'm not embarrassed for okay. you. So. <laughs> I wonder if the relative depth of the sediments here is one of the reasons that I'm not seeing those echiurin spoonworms. So my mm. impression of them is they build a vertical burrow and then sort of feed out from the top. And I don't know how deep that burrow has to be. But, you know, you can see obviously lots of rock sticking out here. So I don't think we're looking at sediment that's too deep. Yeah, no, I don't think we're looking at meters of sediment. We might be looking at, right. uh, you know, less than a meter in most of these places even, I would think, on this, at least on this slope here. I so. agree. So that might be one explanation. The endropneust worms, they're surface dwellers. They kind of move over the surface kind of like the sea cucumbers. So I think we could have seen those. And I haven't seen the same sort of feeding traces that we saw when we first settled, and that was probably deeper sediment. Although, you know, we did see all that pavement yeah. down there too, didn't we? Again, maybe maybe just along this ridge we're getting some currents and kind of flushing it out. I don't know. A little uh, tiny cup coral. We've seen a few of these now, and I was calling it a juvenile before. Maybe this is as big as they get. They sure are small. But now you can see very clearly from the top we're seeing those septa. Right. So you're actually seeing the inside of the skeleton and you kind of see the transparent tentacles around the edge and then it's kind of yellowing in the center. That's basically where the mouth is going into the uh, the gastrovascular space, which is the digestive space. Just next to it, you see there's kind of a, on the right side, there's kind of a wiry little structure. It's got two branches. That's a carnivorous sponge. Looks like a little tuning fork. Really small on the right side of that sponge. So we collected a much larger carnivorous sponge earlier kind of looked like a starburst that's another type if we look in the sediment chute again on the right side 
It looked to me like there was a line in the sediment. Sorry, no, off the rock. There's a really wide, yeah, the, if you look in the Sirius view, you see that big channel with sediment off to the right? Yeah. Yeah, so down there, I thought I saw like a very straight line going up slope. And I don't know if that was just oh. a mirror of a rock down there or if it was actually a trail. Maybe it's just a rock that's funneling stuff that's kind of yeah. drifting down the slope. Yeah, because oh. I don't see it now. Oh, yeah, no, look, right up here, right up there. Oh, okay. That's what I mean. Yeah. Um. So I'm looking straight up the chute now, just left of the laser. You can see there's kind of a line in the sediment. And I don't know if that's a series of burrows or that's evidence that something has kind of worked its way along the sediments. It's so straight. A rock came tumbling down, but there aren't many rocks tumbling around here right now. So, yeah. uh, uh, Back out just a bit and zoom just below off screen. Yeah, right there. You see that? Yeah, right where the lasers are. Thank you. Huh. Again, yeah, so I don't know. Did a fish sort of try to eat something that was in there? Follow that trail? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Pilot. All right, well, I think that uh, brings us to the end of the dive, Bill. Yeah, thanks to everyone for tuning in today and for all our shore-based uh, scientists who participated. Um, and we'll be uh, transiting tomorrow, but um, our shore-based scientists be on the lookout for uh, an update about dive times as we move into Palomara. And we've already had our uh, pre-dive call for the next dive. We had that this morning before the dive, so um, no phone calls right now. Right. Get a bit of a break, and uh, we're looking forward to joining you in two days. Thanks for your help, everybody. We had a lot of input today from shore, and it was much appreciated. Yeah, great dive. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, pilots. Nice job, Scott and Dale. All right. Night, Tim. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. There were uh, many more fish than I had expected to see at this depth. I think it was probably because we were over a lower gradient uh, substrate, but it was really good. Thanks. So I, I got to see most of everyone that I thought I would see in terms of the fishes. Um, the Ophidias and Ipnops, those were all, and Bathysaurus. The McCurry was pretty surprising, um, but we almost got everyone we were looking for. Thanks for all those comments, folks, and the review comments. Much appreciated.